I'd like to call the Henderson County Board of Public Education December 13th meeting to order. And as we do so, before we all stand and share in the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like to ask all of those who are with us today, as well as those who are joining us online, as we think about the challenges that we individually face, that we think about our neighbors in Kentucky and in Arkansas and in Illinois, uh, families and communities that have been torn apart by natural disaster, that we might lift them up and think about those school families, those school communities, and our fellow Americans as they are challenged by that time. And so let us honor, just lift them up in a moment of silence before we say a pledge together. Thank you for doing so. Please join me in, by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much. As we begin our meeting today, we are fortunate enough to have a couple of recognitions. And first, I would like to ask Mr. Scott Rhodes, our Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, to step to the podium to share a little bit about the process for Henderson County Principal of the Year. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Members of the board, it gives me great pleasure to be able to talk to you about our Principal of the Year process. Principal of the Year here in Henderson County Public Schools, to me, is one of the greatest recognitions that we have. And the reason is, is because this is a recognition that the principals within our school community, they vote for the principal of the year. It has nothing to do with our leadership team or anyone else. It is voted on by their peers. And this year's recipient of this year's principal of the year, Ms. Mar Dr. Marcia Justice, is just epitomizes everything it is to be a wonderful principal here in Henderson County Public Schools. And for her to be selected by her peers is a great Great honor. And so, Dr. Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. And uh, Dr. Justice is here with us today, but as she joins us here today, I just want to share with the board and the public, uh, as Mr. Rhodes said, Dr. Justice represents one of those people that you get to say is all in. She is all in for her students. She is all in for her school community. She is a tremendous model for her fellow peers. But as Mr. Rhodes said, when you celebrate Principal of the Year, you are celebrating the recognition of your peers, the men and women that understand what it is to lead in a school community and certainly to lead in a school community today. Uh, we have to celebrate Dr. Justice as among the finest in our profession and certainly among the finest among her colleagues here in Henderson County Public Schools. And as we all know, when you are representative of the school system, you move on to a regional competition and then possibly even a state competition. But more so, they become the flagship, the person who represents our school system. And so it is a real honor to celebrate Dr. Marsha Justice today. I'm going to ask her to come down right here just so that we can. She loves to be in front of large crowds, and so we're going to put her in front of everybody and say congratulations. And I did check that plaque. That was not Mr. Rhodes's Principal of the Year plaque that he re-gifted. He did not re-gift. Uh, that is, uh, he, no, we did. he did not. That, you can keep that one, Dr. Justice. That one is just yours. Congratulations. Uh, you are a fine representative of the principalship, and Henderson County Public Schools could not be prouder. Thank you so very much. Uh, we're also joined by another special guest, one of our outstanding elected leaders and one of the finest mayors I know, not just in this state, but anywhere in the country. Mayor Barbara Volk, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. This is, yes. um, I'm here uh, not as mayor, but as chairman of the board of Land of Sky Regional Council. Land of Sky is a planning and coordinating agency um, made up of elected and appointed representatives from counties and municipalities in Madison, Buncombe, Henderson, and Transylvania counties. 
And every year we present awards to outstanding individuals within the region, feel, people that we feel have uh, gone above and beyond um, what their job title might uh, imply. And uh, the, some of our awards this year went to the school superintendents in the five uh, public school districts throughout the region. Um, most of them were at a state conference the day we presented the awards, so they were not able to be there. Um, but I think this is probably an even more appropriate location to present this extraordinary public service award to Dr. John Bryant. So if you appreciation for your devotion, commitment, and exemplary service as superintendent of Henderson County Schools. Your unwavering dedication to the students of Henderson County and our region has helped our region respond to the many challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Land of Sky Regional Council is grateful for your exemplary leadership and dedication to public service. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful surprise, Mayor Volk. You may come to every meeting. <laughs> thank you so very much. And thank you for your service in our community as well, Mayor Volk. Thank you so very much. With that, uh, we will move from recognitions to the election of board officers. Um, and I will assist in that process as secretary to the board. Uh, we will now have the opportunity to select a chair and vice chair, each to serve for one year in accordance with board policy 2200. And per policy, I will conduct the election. Just as a reminder regarding consecutive terms, a board member may not serve more than four consecutive terms as chair unless a member takes a two-year break in service from the chair position. The board will first elect the chair and then the vice chair second. In a moment, I will open the floor for nominations for each position separately. And the board will vote in the order that the nominations are received until a candidate receives at least four affirmative votes. Candidates for chair and vice chair may vote for themselves. And before I open the floor, I just want to remind everybody, Ms. Stacy Kasky, member of our board, is participating in this meeting remotely. So in doing so, we will have a roll call vote as we move through each of those. Are there any questions about the election process before we begin? Ms. Kasky, can you still hear us? I do, and I'd like to make a nomination if you're opening the floor. Well, I was just about to do so, yes, ma'am. So I will open the floor at this time for nominations for the position of chair. I would like to nominate Mr. Blair Craven for Henderson County Board of Education Chairperson. Thank you, ma'am. Are there other nominations? Hearing none, the floor is closed, and we will vote by roll call for Mr. Blair Craven for Chairman of the Board of Education. Mr. Bridges? Yes. Ms. Case? Yes. Ms. Holt? Yes. Mr. Craven? Yes. Mr. Egolf? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. And Dr. Revis? Yes. Thank you. By a vote of seven to zero, we now have a chairperson. Mr. Craven, congratulations. Appreciate uh, all of you guys. Um, you know we've had a tough year, and, and uh, we'll get through it. But I appreciate uh, the vote of confidence from all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And in just a moment, I will return the gavel to you, sir. Thank so you. just one, absolutely. Yeah, just borrow it for me. <laughs> exactly. At this time, uh, I will open the floor for nominations for the position of vice chair. Do I hear any nominations? I would like to nominate Dr. Kathy Revis for position of vice chair for Henderson County Board of Education. Thank you, Ms. Kasky. Other nominations? I would like to nominate Ms. Amy Lynn Holt. Thank you, Mr. Egoff. Other nominations?
Hearing none, the floor is closed for nominations, and so we will roll call vote. And again, we vote in the order in which the nominations are received. So first, for Ms. Kathy Revis, Mr. Bridges? No. Ms. Case? Yes. Ms. Holt? No. Mr. Craven? No. Mr. Egoff? No offense, you're most one of the most respected people I know, but it's no. Thank you. Ms. Kasky? Yes. Dr. Revis? I guess no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now for Mrs. Holt. Mr. Bridges? Yes. Ms. Case? No. Ms. Holt? Yes. Mr. Craven? Yes. Mr. Egoff? Yes, sir. Ms. Kasky? No. Dr. Revis? No. By a vote of four affirmatives to three, Mrs. Holt, congratulations. You are the vice chair. Yes, ma'am. All right, can I take that back over? You may, proudly. That was the yes, sir. most awkward. Um, thank you. Appreciate it. Public comments, that's everybody. All right, let's get on to business. Um, next up is going to be the agenda approval, but I'd like to make a change to the agenda already as my uh, um, first deal as the chair. I would like to go ahead and move new business item number A, the current face covering guidance policy, up um, into, uh, right, before, or right after the program highlight before board chair observations. I would like to get that up front and center. And, and where again? So new business, A, approval yes, for the current face covering guidance and policy. Yes, sir. I would like to move that up to uh, right after the program highlight after the strings. Um, gotcha. Sure. Thank you. Does everybody understand that? Yes, sir. All right. And we have to vote again everything by voice today since Mrs. Kasky is, is online. Um, yes or no to that agenda approval with the amendment, uh, Mr. Bridges? Okay, I'll second that. You'll second it. Yeah. Okay, second. Yes or no? Yes. Ms. Case, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Ms. Holt? Yes. Mr. Egoff? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Revis? Yes. Ms. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes, pass 7 0. Next up, a program highlight. Dr. Bryan, if you'd like to take it away. I'd actually like to ask Dr. Wendy Fry to Perfect. introduce our special guests here today. You are in for a treat. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce and recognize uh, Ms. Amanda Tant. Um, Amanda um, plays a couple of really big roles for our district. She is um, both the orchestra and the chorus teacher, and she works at two schools, Hendersonville Middle and Hendersonville High School. And uh, she would like uh, at this time to say a few words to you and then to introduce these fine students who are with us today. Thank you so much, Ms. Tant. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Thank you, members of the board. Um, I wanted to say that um, and remind you that earlier this year, this board voted to fund our band and orchestra programs, giving us significant support to expand the access of all middle and high school students to instrumental music education. This is not something that you see in every district and we are so grateful. On behalf of the string teachers, I just wanna say um, that this means more instruments for students who would otherwise not be able to rent or buy their own instrument. Um, on behalf of the band teachers, it means instruments as well, as well as test kits that I believe Dr. Fry will be passing around for you to look at so that students at the elementary school level may try different mouthpieces and decide what they want to play when they get to sixth grade. Um, it also means expanded elementary recruitment, funding for buses to get students from their schools to other schools so that students can hear what they have access to at the middle and high school level. Um, it brings me a lot of pride to be a part of this department, um, and the music department that is, and um, to know that you guys have given us so much support financially as well as personally. 
Um, I also wanted to read the statement from Mr. Clace on behalf of the band directors. He says, school board members and senior staff, on behalf of all the band directors, thank you, thank you, thank you. That part was in all caps. <laughs> we are so grateful for the funds to purchase instruments, recruiting assistance, and for addressing, addressing equity and access in instrumental music. Elementary visits are beginning this week with performances by high school bands for at least eight elementary schools. We are so excited to tell these students that everyone has a chance to play an instrument. Arts programs are a crucial part of students' social and emotional learning, and we know that their engagement in the arts will lead to increased engagement in all of their schoolwork. Every child needs a reason to come to school and we are grateful for your help in extending this to more students. Again, thank you. I want to, um, at this time, introduce the string quartet that is on our stage. These are all members of the Hendersonville High School um, Orchestra program. We have Mr. Sean Macaroni playing violin. We have Gabby Magellan playing violin, Rakem Bain playing viola, and Aidan Chacon playing cello. They are going to perform three pieces for you after they tune, and we're just going to let them roll one to the other, so I won't speak anymore, and you can just listen to the music and enjoy it. But the first piece they'll be playing is It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. The second piece is by a Baroque composer, Ant Antonio Vivaldi, um, and it's titled Winter, and I think you'll hear the harsh winter weather that we are not experiencing right now in the piece. And then finally, you will hear Carol of the Bells and Green Sleeves, um, and it's going to rock. So thank you guys so much for listening to these students and for supporting them. And students, you can go ahead and tune and then get going.
was awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Tant, and to, uh, to all of you guys for spreading the Christmas cheer. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Um, okay. All right, I gotta get back in here. Sorry, give me a second, guys. So while you're doing that all, um, so my son was in orchestra his, uh, I think it was sophomore year. They go down, the high schoolers go down to Bruce Drysdale and do a, like a Halloween concert for the kids, at the elementary kids at Bruce Drysdale. And they dress all up and it's, it's, they do a great job. She's amazing. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, next we are going to move to uh, new business, which is um, a approval for the current face covering guidance um, and policy. So Dr. Bryant, would you take that away? Yes, sir, absolutely. We'll go, uh, with your permission there, go straight to the return to learn update and work through that information. And uh, as is always the case, if the board has questions about the information that's being presented here as it relates to ultimately the determinations, please don't hesitate to let me know. We will begin again with a familiar slide. Uh, it is a little different than we've seen in the past in the sense it really tried to focus on where we have been since July until now, right now. And so in our last uh, couple of meetings, we talked about this data, the way in which this data is informing the decisions, and we are seeing an uptick in the uh, seven-day rolling average here in our community. As of yesterday, because that is the most recently published data, it's 38.9 here in Henderson County. Additionally, we've talked about some perspective, again, looking at where we were in early November and then sort of understanding where we are right now. Again, this is that risk level look uh, at the county. We have seen an uptick in that data. Again, this is as of December the 11th. We have also looked at the county alert system as a way of understanding transmission by county. Again, this is the Centers for Disease Control, their community transmission map. Looking here, you're looking at the seven-day period, again, from December the 5th until December the 11th and then a December 3rd through December 9th for percent positivity. And you can see that most of the counties in North Carolina at this time are designated as high transmission, which is 25 or higher. Specific to our COVID dashboard, we continue to report publicly, as we've talked about in each and every meeting, our daily rates by school site. And again, those are individual. We did stop the daily alert notifications on October 22nd and just like to remind the board and the public at that. The district dashboard is updated daily and then the quarantine numbers are reflected on a weekly basis uh, for the general public to look at what those numbers are across the board. This infographic again commits, shares our commitments to the school system, to our school system families and the information that we're providing to the general public. When we look at our current operations as of our November 22nd board meeting, face coverings are required and must be worn by all students, teachers, staff, and adult visitors when indoors in a pre-K through grade six school setting unless a legal exception applies and that determination was made until January 1st, 2022. Face coverings are currently optional for all students, teachers, staff, adult visitors when indoors in grades seven through grade 12 school settings Again, unless a different legal exception applies. A reminder for the board and the public that face coverings are required while traveling on school buses and other group transportation settings. That's a federal requirement that isn't at the board's purview. When you look at face covering requirements in North Carolina, we've looked at this map repeatedly through the period and you can see where it stands now. There are lots of colors and lots of different colors and I'll just make sure that everybody understands what those colors mean as we think about how this uh, looks across the state. Red that you see is masks optional. Blue is masks required. In those dark green, they're making determinations on a week to week or a bi-weekly basis based on percent positivity in the community. Where you see the light green, you're talking about the difference between a city and a county school system. Some communities in our state have more than one school system within their own county and so you see optional in some areas and required in the others. Then you see a uh, school by school basis in Surrey County, which is the only one that's gray. And then yellow are differentiated by group. Hyde County is optional for vaccinated students and staff. And of course, in Henderson County, we're looking at the designations pre-K through grade six and then optional seven through 12. Senate Bill 654 does require that this board votes at least once a month, and this is our only scheduled board meeting for this month, about whether or not to continue the current policy or whether or not to modify that policy. We've talked about that repeatedly. In terms of understanding the quarantine impact, and again, this is weekly data that we share uh, with the public and with the board. You can see our positivity in our schools is 84 total positive cases last week, the week of December the 6th, and 292 
quarantines that were a result of that. Because it is a frequently asked question, I'll go ahead and address it just for the board and maybe the public. If you were to ask for that breakdown by grade level when you're looking at this particular map because of the conditional difference in elementary grades through middle and high. For our elementary schools, 35 of those positive cases are in elementary school. 83 of the quarantines are resulting uh, in those positivities in elementary school. For middle school, there were 16 positive cases last week and 68 resulting quarantines. And for our high school environments, there were 33 positives and 141 resulting quarantines uh, from that data. What I'd like to share with the board is some new information. Uh, we have been constantly talking about the ways in which we support our students. We've discussed the quarantining guidance, the guidance from the Department of Health and Human Services, what that means, and then, of course, the impact of that, as you saw in the previous slide. One of the things that we have been recently exploring is learning more about the test to stay study, which is through the ABC Collaborative. If you remember, the ABC Collaborative is a partnership with Duke University and the Department of Health and Human Services that really began tracking and monitoring COVID data since the beginning of this pandemic in North Carolina. And one of the studies that they began to explore with a number of pilot school systems was test to stay. And specifically that relates to quarantining guidance in this state. So I'm going to look, I want you to take a look at these first two bullets and I'm going to read them because there's a lot of text on these slides so that we understand exactly what the test to stay study is. And in short, it's a research study that is intended to evaluate the transmission of COVID in schools. Participants are students or staff who are identified as close contacts. Those are the individuals that ultimately are directed to quarantine when they have been determined to be a close contact with someone that's tested positive. This board remembers close contacts can be any individual, but there are conditions that make them required to quarantine if they're unvaccinated, uh, if they were unmasked, if they haven't tested positive for COVID in the last 90 days and otherwise. In this particular study, if individuals participate or schools or school systems do, they are required to consent and will be allowed to remain in school after having close contact or being deemed to be a close contact, provided that they are tested for COVID at pre-specified intervals, which means there's a testing period. They have no symptom, symptoms. They agree to continued proper masking and remain negative on the rapid antigen tests. So again, I want to repeat that statement. The test to study or test to stay study is available if these provisions are met. You have to wear masks. You have to wear a mask if you're determined to be a close contact during that repeated test period? That's a great question, Mr. Egal. So if, for example, I wasn't wearing a face covering, I'm a high school age student, I'm determined to be a close contact, and we were participants in this study, I would, one, have to consent to testing every two days. I would have to consent to wearing a face covering in the school environment in order to not quarantine and continue to not have symptoms. If those things are true, I don't go home for 10 days. If those things are true, I don't go home for 14 days. It is designed to prevent the interruption in the educational service and then study the impact of that. What yes, happens sir? if you don't want you don't want to be tested or you choose not to? Then you would be have to be that. quarantined. That's correct. Yes, sir. So it's voluntary participation. So if I'm a student or I'm a staff member, I say, you know, I don't want to test every two days. Then again, the consent is required. You simply would be required to quarantine per the Health and Human Service guidelines. So this is an opportunity, as I'll share with the board, to consider further that would create a space for folks to be eligible to not quarantine. Can, can I also want to point out that so if you are a student in school, um, high, high, like 12 and above now and then 5 to 11 once they pass the vaccination, you know, second test or second vaccine and all that, if you are a staff member, if you are um, around someone that has tested positive and you're allowed to stay, you need to wear, you have to wear a mask. The health department says you can, you know, like if I was a teacher and I was vaccinated, they would say to me, okay, you can stay in your class, but you have to mask until um, you're tested like on day five um, is what they allow. So um, vaccinated people, that are allowed to stay now are required to wear a mask to stay. So those 292 kids that we had um, quarantined last week and 250 of them decide that, hey, I'm willing to take part in this, I'll, I'll get tested. Um, my tests are negative, I'm wearing a mask. They can stay in school the entire time um, as long as they 
meet those requirements, show no symptoms, don't test positive, wear your mask, and then after the end of day, what can they be done? I'll share with you that that's that's a perfect click to slide there. I'm glad <laughs> wait to for the click. Yeah, wait for the click. I think that was Mary Louise Corn that talked about yeah. it. So you look here, so, so what does that mean for us? So again, number one, bullet number one, um, if Henderson County Public Schools were to participate in the test to stay study, then it would allow students to remain in school, staff as well, despite their exposure and determining to be a close contact. It is arguably uh, will minimize the disruptions to the school day and home operations so students are not being quarantined. Participants also benefit from the testing, the symptom screening, the face covering requirement, and then possibly the early identification of a COVID positive test. That's directly from the, the, the study data, that the, these bullets. So what does that mean for them, bullet two, as you mentioned there, Mr. Craven? They are tested on the day after exposure, whenever that's determined to be, so day one, again on day three, five, and seven. After that period of time, they no longer have to test and they remain so long as they have no symptoms for the 14-day period. So the testing stops after day seven, but the 14-day period, you have an obligation to self-report symptoms if you have them. What about the mask? Yeah. The, requ the requirement for the face covering is, is through the end of the testing period, but we'll verify that as well. Okay. So, so end of day seven or end of day 14? I believe that to be the case, but I will double check that. Which what one? to be the case? During the testing period that you have to wear it the while seven. you're tested, the seven day seven period. Days. Yes, sir. Okay. But I will double check that because, uh, again, I don't want to speak out of turn. The last piece there is the school nurse or other designee will perform the COVID-19 test on consenting individuals again. So we have a partnership with our health department and our school nurses, and so part of this is uh, learning the logistical lift that would be required to do so, all right? And that is undetermined at this particular point. This is being shared with the board specifically, and I'll get to your question, Ms. Case, is to understand what the, t the study is and what the opportunity might be for the board to participate. As you'll see on the next slide, ultimately it does require several things. Number one, the board has to formally approve us to explore and participate in this work. Two, that it requires local health department approval to say, we will partner with you in this work, and then to map out the resources necessary to do that. Because again, you're not just testing one time. You're testing every two days, every student group that might be in that category. Mrs. Case? How old does the student have to be to make his own decision, and how will we get parents to approve it? Sign a document or what? So we would require, as uh, Dr. Revis even mentioned in a previous, active consent for all students under our care. And so a student who's 18 or emancipated or otherwise may have the ability to make a decision for themselves. But for a student who's under our school system, we request direct and active parent consent if they were to participate. Yes, good question. So when we look at this slide again, why we share this with you right now is because as the board evaluates its decision on its current policy or its future policy or how we are operating, we have spent a great deal of time talking about the quarantine impact, the way in which that affects students, especially students um, who are determined to be a close contact. When you look at those numbers, 141 high school students, 68 middle and 83 elementary school students, remembering again, those are not positive cases. Those are students that are determined to be close contacts and then directed to be home for a 10 to a 14 day period. If, if the board were to consider this for approval, again, number one, we would require action today. You would need to formally make a motion that would approve us to explore more about our participation. We would continue our discussions with the health department about what that partnership would look like. We would further study the details and review the details of the participation, what the logistics would be, and potentially present to the board a launch date if that were approved. And then, of course, we would be coordinating those communications because per that parent dialogue, community dialogue, and otherwise, that would change our operational conditions. Mr. Craven? Before we get going any further, have you had any discussions with Steve Smith, who I'm assuming that would be the uh, liaison we would have to work with through the health department? Um, is his staff, are they willing to be able to participate in this? They're absolutely willing to explore more about the details. So what we know right now is this broad overview, and I've spoken to uh, the health department director, Steve Smith. We are scheduling meetings later this week to learn more one way or the other, whether the board takes action today or not, so that we have more details about the way that that's looked. We've asked for some data on the school systems that are participating in the pilot. I've spoken to a number of those superintendents in terms of learning more about that piece. 
like anything else, what I can tell you very candidly, it's, it's about the logistics of the lift, right? When you're a school system of 13,000 kids and you have hundreds of students that might fall into that quarantine group, it's going to require manpower, it's going to require administrative support, it's going to require communication. And so what the health department is committed to at this point is learning more so that if the board were to approve this, we would be able to have uh, the details that are necessary to communicate um, the possibility of a launch. Do we have any other avenues of reducing quarantines at this current time? No, sir, we do not. We are required to follow the Department of Health and Human Services direction. The health department is required to provide that direction. Uh, in terms of having a solution to solving the quarantine problem, this presents a pathway for us. So I want to ask again because somehow on Facebook, the information's never right. <laughs> So if we approve today the test to stay um, for our whole school district, we can have parents that say no or employees that say no, I'm not testing because there are people out there that don't want to be tested. No, I'm not testing or no, my child isn't testing. And then they quarantine. Same exact thing as they're doing now. That's absolutely correct. Okay. So just like so. right now, if you've been directed to quarantine for a 14-day period, you have the ability to voluntarily test to reduce the quarantine period. Right. There is no requirement to do so. Just like in this situation, if the board were to approve it right now, all you would be doing is saying, we have board support to continue to learn more. Right? that we would be able to bring back more information to you. Because, again, I can't commit the resources of the health department. They have been partners of ours. We want to explore this further as an option that could be presented to the board because we've been in discussion regarding this particular piece. But if approved right now, we're not signing anything with the ABC Collaborative. We would be pushing forward to learn more. Yes, ma'am. And as a part of this, we're not going to be vaccinating children, correct? That's correct. Okay. No, ma'am. With principals, who would be administering these tests? It likely would be nurses or additional staff from the health department, uh, but but our school staff don't administer the tests. Okay. Tell me. These, I'm sorry, Ms. Case. Do we give these tests to a student who has some symptoms to be sure that it's COVID and not something else? So we have the ability to do PCR tests in schools now so we could look at symptomatic in that particular way. Remembering, again, if you're symptomatic, you're going to have to have negative tests in order to stay. But symptomatic will quarantine you automatically for self-isolation. We could give them this test and then they could... They would likely not be taking this rapid antigen test. If you're symptomatic, you're going to take a PCR test, which is going to be a lab-confirmed test. Yes, ma'am. If we approve this... Do you have a start date, or do you have any idea when that might be? Not yet. Uh, we'll have more information at the end of this week, Mr. Bridges, as we learn a little bit more. I think what we would want to be able to do is learn about what the logistical lift would be, what the partnership lift would be, and what the finalized requirements would be from the ABC Collaborative and the board to have a full picture of that. We certainly could be working between now and the next time the board meets to understand what that is. But I know that this board has challenged us to find solutions and implement those solutions as soon as we are readily available. So as soon as we know more, we would share more. I know you're not a medical doctor. That's correct. Yes, sir. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express. Hall. There you go. But can you tell, do you have any idea of what how this test is done? As I understand it, it's a rapid antigen test, which just might show a positive or a negative. But I, I is a nasal swab mm -hmm. that that I'm I'm not certain of specifically to this particular. Uh, I've read that it is a nasal swab. I don't know if that's correct, but I've read that. I have too. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't know how many elementary kids children. Are, are going to be okay with getting a nasal swab. I think this is going in, in the right direction, obviously, looking at quarantines. But, again, I work with the second graders. I know that a lot of them are not going to want a Q-tip stuck up their nose. And, you know, I just want us all to just look at what we have. We have three vaccines. We have a booster. We have monoclonal <laughs> antibodies for those that are immune, immunocompromised. 
We have answers to, to all of this. And yet we still, we want to quarantine a kindergartner or a first grader. Or a, I, I know. I, I'm just saying, I'm not going to be satisfied until we as a board, and, I, and I'm not saying unanimous, but we as a board work harder to send a message with the county commissioners, because I think they're behind us, and we try to keep these kids in school. And if you're worried about COVID, get the vaccine. If you're worried, still worried about COVID, get the second shot. If you're still worried, get the booster. If you can't get the vaccine, get the monoclonal antibodies, which were approved by the FDA last week. We just can't keep living in fear and sending kids home. And if they don't want us to get a Q-tip stuck up their nose, tell them, tough, you're gone. That's, that's my piece. But I think this would be a game changer for some children and families to be able, asymptomatic close contact children, not to have to quarantine. And I think those are the children that we've all you know, really struggle with having to be 10 days, 14 days out of school, whatever, and w with no symptoms. And I think this would be a way to allow those children to continue with their education. And Jay, one thing that I did read, and I don't, I don't know that I've got the medical term right, um, it's not a deep nasal swab with this. So I'm sure a kindergartner will be okay with that. <laughs> Well, again, I feel a responsibility to share with the board the options that are there, especially as we talk about what communications exist as we move forward. We can continue to, as this board directed and we're drafting right now, that communication at the state level. This information is shared with the board so that they can give it consideration and ultimately determine whether or not this presents a pathway to reduce the number of students that ultimately would be quarantined. We will uh, garner as much information as the board sees fit. Again, what, what I would be seeking from the board today is a decision as to whether or not you wish to take formal approval of us pursuing and learning more. As I said, we're scheduled to learn more this later this week, but we certainly would not want to move forward without this board's full support to explore this option further. They're scheduled to pay for the swabs. They're, they're, they're provided to you as part of the study, so the state of North Carolina. So um, one thing that I would like for you to find out is um, if I'm a parent and I don't want my child tested at school, I don't feel like my child is going to, um, you know, do well with that, like especially the little ones. Lots of times when I take my kid in for a COVID test, if they've been a close contact, it's not fun. I have to help hold them down. Um, would I be able to, as a parent, take my child to my pediatrician's office to keep their health information their health information at the pediatrician's office, get a negative test, and then have that faxed into the nurse as part of, you know, like they're doing it now. They have to have nerd for, uh, word from the, the doctor's office. I'd like to find that out so that parents can, protect, you know, just take their kids to their doctor. I mean, this piece, it has to be done. In my opinion, we have to offer at school because the, we have a huge demographic of parents that, don't have transportation to a doctor's appointment or, you know, they work a full-time job and they, they can't take their child to a pediatrician and they can't stay home in quarantine for 10 to 14 days. So, I mean, I think that part is imperative too, but a lot of parents I think are, are going to want to let their doctors be over their health information and then just notifying the nurse. Yes, ma'am. We'll be glad to get an answer to that question. Okay. And so a motion today would, ass would essentially allow you to continue with the ABC Collaborative to get more detailed information as to what, when, where, how, why. Absolutely. The, the ABC Collaborative requires that we have board, board support and board approval before we would proceed further. And so uh, in order that they might consider additional school systems to participate in this study, I want to be able to tell them the board has support for us to learn more. And if the board does not, then we can end the conversation, certainly. Ms. Kasky, do you have anything to add? Um, no, we haven't heard from you. Ms. Kasky? All right. Sounds good. All right. Uh, you
you need to reset everything? Okay, give us give us a few minutes. Let us talk for a few. Um, if you've had COVID within the last, oh, I want to talk about that. Ninety days. I think that's what they currently say. Do you have to submit to these tests and or quarantine? You mean as part of the study? As I've just, I've, I, I know of people that have been quarantined that have had COVID and were not offered a test to prove they have the antibodies and they should not have been quarantined so under the health department's rules, not J.E. Golf's rules, the health department's rules. That he right. is correct, and I have that as one of my notes because I know um, I've talked to school nurses that, that have had that, and I wanted to see my note is um, if we could adjust the flow chart to include that in there. I know we don't make the flow chart that that's part of the health department, but I think parents need to see that, that it, or employees, that if they have antibodies, if they've had COVID, it's actually if they still even have the antibodies. So it could have been, you know, I could say, well, it's been, you know, three months and 14 days. The nurse says to them, get an antibody test. If you have them, you do not have to quarantine. I know that that they're allowing that. Yes. So I wanted to, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I wanted to um, see if we could get that flow chart updated by the health department to include that. For and her. well, uh, on top of that, though, I believe that antibody test is $40 and all these other tests are free of charge. If you take the test with us, that's correct. Yes, sir. Like a PCR or antigen test, we don't charge. That's correct. So mm -hmm. how do we? Yeah, like maybe we can see if the health department can offer that because you're going to have families that can't afford a forty dollar. I didn't know they were custom. Yeah, I just don't want to keep quarantining people, especially if they just had COVID a month ago and they don't and they're symptom free. And yet, I mean, my job on the school board is is it's simple. I want to get to keep the kids in school and get them educated. That's it. So if you've had COVID a month ago and you're symptom free and you have antibodies. I can't, I, it just doesn't go right in my head that we're sending this person home. Well, oh, well, he can't afford $40 or his parents can't afford, oh, well, then you still got to go. I mean, it just doesn't make, we're talking about fairness and we're talking about. Again, we'll follow up with the guidance as it's presented and make some determinations. Because it is $40. Where those antibody tests can be offered. Absolutely. Before we vote, um, we have lost Mrs. Kasky, um, audio and video. Uh, are you rebooting the system now? Okay, so um, we're going to wait for her for just a minute. Um, if there's any other questions or anything for Dr. Bryant on this matter. Certainly more to come either way yeah, as I we're learning more. I think what's important here, I, I agree with everything you're saying. I think we're, we're up against a brick wall on, on the quarantine. I agree. Yeah. I think that this may be a step in the right direction. It is. To try to find us a way to get out of the quarantine vacuum that we've been in because we know we can't keep doing this um well it was 300 last week that's crazy that right? we have just sitting home with absolutely no right. instruction and and no symptoms they're right. not they're right I mean, healthy yeah, we children don't, we don't know that we know, we don't yeah, know. Some my of child is at home and she has no symptoms trust yeah. me i know so, some I mean, of them I don't know how many of those 300 are like yeah uh, we've um uh, is this one we're going to talk about the letter or a resolution during this yeah I mean time. I, we can certainly talk about that as well I'm not a big resolution person um, so to speak I don't think resolutions really do anything I like more action and, and but I'm more than willing to um, send a letter if that's what this board chooses to I do I thought we voted on that last month we, we, we did I'm just saying I don't think that a resolution actually gets anything done I think things like this actually get stuff done um, I am more than willing to to send anything up. Um, and a draft letter board. is ready. Part of part of the conversation here was what decision is made on this particular piece because I think that impacts part of the message. You know, what steps is the Board of Education taking? What available steps do we have in the state as it relates to that? Even some of the, the language that we've seen in resolutions across the state and other school systems otherwise. The focus here is the board chooses to go one direction or another. I think that helps inform the final version of that letter. Mrs. Kasky, are you back with us? Maybe. 
He's muted. You're muted. Ms. Kasky? I'm here. I'm here. There we go. Okay. Do you have any questions about this? We've uh, were you able to hear it? No. Yeah. I was able I was able to hear it as well. We were getting everything fixed on this end, but I was able to hear it. Okay. Um, do you have any questions about the test to stay program that Dr. Bryant sent us earlier and, and that he's outlined today? No, I don't. I read through the whole thing, so. All right. Well, I would like to go ahead and make a motion to approve um, allowing the leadership team to explore the test to stay option uh, for Henderson County Public Schools. I'll second that motion. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a voice vote once again. Uh, Mr. Bridges, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Case, yes or no? Yes. Mrs. Holt? Yes. Uh, Mr. Egal? Yes. Dr. Revis? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. That passes 7-0. Um, next, uh, before we get going, I'd like to go ahead and get it out of the way. Um, this board has made a commitment that masks are going to be optional um, January 1st, or at least I've made a commitment. Um, so I would like to go ahead and make a motion that we continue the current mask guidance that we put in place, I believe, three weeks ago to make all masks optional in Harrison County Public Schools starting January 1st. Second. All right, is there any discussion on this matter? If there is none, we'll take a vote. Um, Mr. Bridges, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Case, yes or no? Yes. Ms. Holt? Yes. Mr. Egolf? Yes, sir. Dr. Revis? Yes. Ms. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes, that passes 7-0. All right, Dr. Bryant, um, do you have anything else to show us for the current uh, face covering guidance and policy as presented in new business? As it stands, no, sir. The final slide was simply the one you've seen before uh, uh, regarding fluid models. So we'll, we'll proceed with our communications from there. Great. So are we going to come back and discuss yeah, the letter at a later time? Yeah, let's talk about it right now. Um, where, where are we with the letter? Um, tell us more about that and uh, being that we just approved this test to stay program. So per the direction that I received at the November 22nd uh, board meeting, there was direction to put together a letter with regard to the board's concerns and our operational concerns involving quarantining, how that affects students, how that affects our instructional services. That draft is in its form as it states the concerns and the inconsistencies and some of the challenges that were noted in the previous board meeting. The summary paragraphs are affected by, so what, what operation is the board taking right now and per this board's decision I'll update the final part of that and then provide that to the board so that if they would like to send it by the end of this week we can do so ultimately it's directed to our state leaders our Department of Health and Human Services and our elected leaders because we talked about how important that is we have heard from our Board of Commissioners about their similar concerns the concerns associated with quarantines the way that that impacts and some of the inconsistencies associated with it I can say that our partner agency, the health department, has tried as hard as we have to navigate that space and the challenges of it. And I want to say our appreciation to them because they're faced with some of the same challenges that we are with regard to the state guidance and otherwise. But I'll provide that to the board by the, the middle of this week. Yeah, what I'd like to have is I'd like to have that to each of us by at least by Wednesday um, so that um, the chair and the vice chair can, we, we can um, talk with you guys about it, make sure there's no revisions that need to be made. Um, and then we can come in and we can sign that letter and I would like it out by Friday um, to all of our leaders and to Steve Smith and the North Carolina Department of Hu Health and Human Services, which can really help us with the quarantine um, guidance. Yes, ma'am. John, do you think we can have that, uh, the stay thing by the time we get back? No, ma'am, I don't believe that we can, but we'll know enough that we can come back and share. We'll potentially have an implementation date by that point, given that we have sort of three business or four business days on the end of this week, and then we come right back. We'll know enough later this week, we hope, to be able to share the possibility of a launch date. But I don't think it's reasonable to have all the pieces in place by the time that we return. So I'm asking that because the high schools will be having EOCs there mid-January. Yes, ma'am. The elementary schools are going to have testing from January. The I don't know when till how long, how long, Wendy. They've got iReady and they've got something else. What else? A state test. Yeah. And those kids are going to be quarantined and then 
you know, it's going to be. We will certainly share with the board, as I said, that as soon as we could implement reasonably, we will present that information to the board. But I, w I don't believe that it's possible to have implementation by the time we return. Do you have to have us come back and vote on implementing it? No, right? Just that we're no, ma okay. No, ma'am. What, what I would be looking for you now that we have full board support and unanimous board support is we would continue to provide information about what we learn moving forward, and then we would share that with you. And it may simply be communication. It may be, hey, we're ready to go as soon as X. And then if the board had any concerns and asked us to pause, we could wait. But given the support that we have today, once we learned what the logistics are, we could move forward as soon as possible. And when I was reading this, I forgot to ask this before, I thought I remembered reading a time like it's it's a 60-day thing or, you know, something like that. The original pilot study had school systems partnering for four weeks. Uh, we want to yeah. learn a little bit more about that because okay. they have been ongoing for longer than that. And, of course, what we've learned is they are now adding other school systems to the study. So there seems to be an expansion to the research. So we want to understand all those different elements because we know, of course, if we start operating in this space, it's going to be an expectation that we get to continue to operate in this space. Right. Um, it, it, it's one thing to start doing it, and it, if it you know, turns into a pumpkin four weeks from now, that's a problem. So yeah. we want to have a very clear picture of what we're talking about. That's why we wanted to share with you what we know today. And again, I uh, always wish we had more answers, but w this is what we know right now, and we will learn more and share more as we know it. We talked about time away, uh, and we're getting ready to step away here <laughs> yes, Friday. But um, Carl and, and Dr. Brian, I'd really like you guys to put your foot to the pedal on this, and let's get this thing done as soon as we possibly can. Fortunately, Mr. And Taylor likes to drive fast. So good. And make sure you let keep us informed along the way um, of how this is going. Okay. We'll do. Thank you. We do. I need Mary Louise Corn here. Um, so if there's nothing else on new business, uh, we will move on to board chair observations. Um, really, I kind of moved everything up today because I wanted to get I wanted to get this part done um, and, and put this news out there. I don't have any observations, um, so to speak. So I'll go ahead and move on to board member observations. Do you have any? Um, yeah, I do. I have a couple. Some of them, um, I just came up with them when we were, you know, meeting in closed session. <laughs> Um, but one of them is, um, I've had a ton of people reach out to me and ask me to once again address the, um, bullying, I guess you would say that, that, and, and the threats that are being made to board members and made on social media, et cetera. Um, I, this, I feel like kind of a broken record to be saying this again, it's not appropriate to go up to board members outside of board meetings, threatening them, um, getting in their faces, screaming at them. Um, and I, I just can't believe that's coming out of my mouth. I feel like somebody that's at a, um, like a Pop Warner game, you know, yelling at parents to stop screaming and cursing in front of their kids. But, I mean, it's just not acceptable. The, the emails that our superintendent has received from people that are... Um, just, I, I can't even read them. I mean, they're just disgusting. And, um, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I wonder why we have a bullying problem in school. And it's because we have people in the community, adults that are doing it and are examples. Um, the, the second one is, um, so, I feel like a, a part of me for the last two years has failed our school system. And it's been because all we have been dealing with hundreds and hundreds of emails a week, sometimes hundreds of them a day, has been about COVID and about masking and all this stuff is going on. And I feel like we have had no time and the superintendent has had no time to further our school district. And I feel like a failure because of that. Um, I know, you know, one of the things that um, we were talking to Dr. Bryant about earlier, and he, you know, he was saying he's always prided himself on every person that calls him back. He calls them within 24 hours. People email him, you know, they get a response back. We have gotten such an exuberant amount of communication from community members, parents, staff, and it's, I don't want it to stop. It's great. I love that all these people are involved, but 
we don't have the capacity to respond within, I mean, sometimes it's been a week and a half and I've gone back and said, I'm sorry, I've not responded. You know, here's my response to that. And um, I, I feel like today I kind of drew a line in the sand that said, okay, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to work on some educational stuff. We're going to do actually what we're supposed to be doing in Henderson County Public Schools, and that's educating these kids. And, um, you know, we talked about doing a strategic vision and, and strategic planning. And um, so I just want to say to all those people who have been emailing, I'm not telling you stop, keep emailing, keep calling us, keep reaching out. But the delay is going to be probably further than what it is because I feel like that we have to um, to, to push these kids forward. We have a lot of mental health that's going on, a lot of uh, learning loss that's going on, and we really have to concentrate on that. Yes, we do need to keep fighting for these quarantines and for things that we don't feel like that's going on that's acceptable, but, um, you know, just kind of know with some grace that we've not been able to respond like we normally do, and it's been, it's been hard, and, um, I'm going to keep pushing forward, trying to get things done. Thank you, Mrs. Holt. I want to say something real quick along with what Mrs. Holt was kind of saying. But, you know, I look around and I, I was coming, we were coming to the meeting and there are at least three sheriff, four, four sheriffs in here. I mean, we got an email about we would have a, uh, a designated parking spot and a secret door access which I took advantage of, but just to check it out, saw some cool stuff, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrible that this, this has come down to this. And when we have votes, we are all elected people and, and we represent different things and different, but we're still elected. We're, and we're a team and if someone says something or votes a different way that doesn't agree with another person, th that's okay. We're still after this, the same goal. We just have different ways of getting there, and, th and that's okay. And, and that's even fallen upon myself. I have not been treating everybody 100%, and that's my mistake. And, and it's okay to have different feelings and different votes and you know i just really mr craven here has done a tremendous job of leading this board through this pandemic so good job and i'm glad it was 7-0 he's a great leader so i appreciate that I made the comment that he didn't have any younger kids. Well, you know what? He's got younger kids younger than mine. So when I say about imperfections and having grace and having patience, I'm saying that looking in the mirror. And I've learned that. And I've got a hard head. If I can learn that, we all can learn that. So let's all take a deep breath and just have patience and grace and forgiveness and we'll all get through this, and our kids will be better off. But, and, and, but don't, because someone voted or someone said something different, let's not tear them up, go up to them, threaten them, follow them, whatever. That's not who we are in Anderson County. We shouldn't need four sheriff officers armed in our meetings. We shouldn't have a designated parking space where we can walk in the back door so we don't get hustled so it's embarrassing thank you so much um this case jay i, I appreciate it. yeah i want to just add to i'm sorry no go ahead miss caskey I, I have no visual i'm sorry i have no visual so i didn't mean to do that i want to first of all thank you jay for what you said um i agree i think i think all of us kind of um we, we've each in different in different ways you know we're passionate about what we what we believe in but we all are here for trying to do what's best for our kids and I think that when you're passionate sometimes it gets out of control and sometimes we we say things that we don't always mean and you have done an amazing job Mr. Craven 
navigating through this. So um, I wanted to say that as well. Um, one thing I did want to add, though, there was some good news this morning on the NC COVID vaccination dashboard. Uh, last meeting, we talked about only a handful of children taking advantage of the ability to get their vaccine. But this morning, it was up to 1,295 children in Henderson County in the age 5 to 11, the 5 to 11 year old age group. So we have almost 1,300 children that have benefited by us giving them the chance to be vaccinated before they get back to school after the holidays. So just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Kasky. Uh, Ms. Case? And the lightning. There was a lady at one of the Hendersonville uh, schools who got an award for uh, this being the security uh, person there. And I think we just should recognize her, too. And her name was Overly. Officer, oh, you're thinking of Jerika Denal? Okay. That, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. National School Resource right. Officer of the Year. That's yes, ma'am. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Anything else? I have something. Yes, sir. On November 10th at uh, Edenville Elementary School, uh, Dr. Justice and her staff and and all her students put on an exceptional program for Veterans Day. Uh, I think she and the whole school need to be commended for that. It was a wonderful program. Thank you, sir. It was so touching. It was. We should next year film that and yep. have that on the on the our website, especially for veterans right that um, I, I know y'all need something better to do. But I mean, he brings up such a good point to see those. It's it wasn't just a veterans program and you're watching the kids express it. It was watching the actual veterans tear up there in the audience. And yeah, that's that's a great point. All right, if there's nothing else, we'll move on to public comments. Um, we have eight. So uh, those eight folks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we'll get the full three minutes, Matthew. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with the first one, uh, uh, Sarah Smith. Come on down. Welcome, Ms. Smith. Hi. <clears throat> um. I had a longer speech, but you guys addressed a lot of it, so thank you. Um, I'm a parent of two young kids in the system. Um, I've been to and I've watched a lot of board meetings, um, and I wanted to say thank you, Ms. Holt, for addressing it. Um, I don't like what we're seeing, and I'm speaking on behalf of friends and family who don't like what we're seeing either. Um, I had a thought maybe we could consider a parent advisory group that could round table with you all instead of throwing these monologues at you. Is that already? We have one. Oh, sorry. In touch with the superintendent. I sure will. <laughs> Dr. Bryant, thank you. Um, there are plenty of folks out here who have unvaccinated underage kids um, and underlying conditions, and they are losing their parental choice, and I'm really excited that it's working in a, in a good direction going forward. Um, there was a gentleman in, a, in the November meeting that asked you to poll parents to see where we all stand. Um, and I think that's a really good idea too, to just get us all on the same page and start building bridges and not tearing them down. Um, a woman at that meeting also asked about banning books. Um, books are the best segue into learning life outside of Hendersonville. I don't know where you all stand on this. I'm sorry I haven't reached out earlier. Um, but please don't ban books outright. Let concerned individuals meet with teachers and admins um, and communicate specific issues and learn from each other. Lastly, it takes a village to raise a child, um, right? I agree with parental choice, but if people are enrolled in public schools, um, we're signing up for this wonderful village to help raise our children, to accept what's best for our whole community, to raise caring, successful adults, and to give our lives, um, give our kids a better life than the one we were given. The people I know, the ones that I'm speaking for, really appreciate this board, this administration, um, for all you guys are doing to help each child reach their highest potential, taking into consideration the hard task of preparing our children for adulthood, to help each child and also community to thrive as individuals and leaders. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Before we go on to the next one, I forgot to um, read the digital public comments that we had for this month. Um, we had 40 this month. 15 were in favor of face coverings. Six were against face coverings. 
Um, we had three that request board make decisions based on science and data. Um, two were disappointed in the school board. Eight were in favor of optional masks for all grade levels. Uh, two were against banning books in schools. Two were against face coverings and vaccines. Uh, one quarantine guidance needs to change, and one was a dress code issue. So, sorry, I forgot that. Next up is going to be Maddie Fischler. Welcome. And then Aaron Fischler, followed by you. As a child in the school in a school currently, I have heard and experienced others getting quarantined. It's harder to learn, and you miss out on games and other things in school when you're gone because of quarantine. Some of my friends' families have had to be quarantined as well as mine. So, what are you choosing? Risk you and your child's safety, or keep a mask on and keep everyone safe? Thank you very much. Great job. And then Aaron Fishler. great isn't she absolutely <laughs> uh, so uh, I am uh, my name is Aaron Fischler I'm a registered respiratory therapist at Mission Hospital I'm also the assistant manager of respiratory care at Caramont Hospital in Gastonia last time I came to speak before this board was several months back and I had hoped that my next opportunity I'd finally be able to say the worst is over Unfortunately, that's not the case today, as once again, COVID is showing itself to be rather resilient. I've been conducting surveys of recent studies, not just of the efficacy of masks in relation to the pandemic, but the effect of COVID on children as a whole. While it's true that COVID itself doesn't affect children and adolescents as severely as adults, it has proven to be fatal in some cases. What hasn't been discussed before this board has been the side effects of contracting COVID that affects children specifically. That's multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. Working this past year in the pediatric intensive care unit of Mission Hospital, I've seen a few of these cases. It's a statement of the hardworking staff at Mission and other area hospitals that we have to date no deaths caused by MISC. Symptoms can include fever, body aches, rapid breathing, increased heart rate, rash, vomiting, and diarrhea. In severe cases, it can cause hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen in the bloodstream, confusion, lethargy, and require breathing assistance, including intubation and mechanical ventilation. I understand that some children don't want to wear masks. Part of that's because of the false information that masks don't work. Masks do work, and they've been proven to work, just like vaccines have been proven to work time and again. The best way to get rid of masks is to give enough time for children to get vaccinated. Not masking and not vaccinating is a guaranteed way to make sure that children, who many think will be falling behind developmentally, will definitely fall behind. Social development is important, but children falling behind much because they are secluded, intubated, sedated, and possibly chemically paralyzed so that they may survive the disease is also a big worry. I would ask just two things to remember before I step down. First, that COVID patients do not get visitors. Second, that MISC is directly related to COVID-19 and affects children ages 5 to 11 the most, with a majority of them being male. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we'll have Katie Gash. Welcome, Mrs. Gash. Thank you. Very festive today. Yes, we had a spirit week at school, so today is Green Day. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as always, I wish to begin by thanking you for all the hard work that you do each and every day. Um, so I must say that with the decision to have a totally mask optional. Um, you know, I'm kind of in two minds with that. Nobody wants to wear the mask, but even as I look at the numbers that you presented here this uh, afternoon, we see that in our elementary schools where they're still masking, um, we have far less quarantines per positive cases. And so I really do think that if we want to make sure that we are reducing the number of students who are in quarantine, one of the things we have to look at is looking at maybe maintaining the masks. 
but I understand that um, I really appreciate the deliberation. I appreciate the discussion that you all have around this. And I just want to know, have your, um, your guarantee that you'll continue to keep an eye on the numbers and continue to be open to reintroducing um, the masking mandates if that seems to be something that would be possible and positive. Um, in addition to that, I, uh, my second point is um, that I attended a League of Women's Voters of Henderson County event on December the 7th, right next door here at the Public Library. And I was so proud to be a, a part of the Henderson County Public School family and to work within a school district headed by Dr. Bryant and his team. Dr. Bryant gave an insightful address about the state of public education here in Henderson County, and he also answered a series of questions. We teachers do not get paid what we deserve. We often do not get fully recognized for the job that we do, and our hours are longer than most could imagine. But what makes all the difference is the love of the children that we serve and the appreciation and the respect we receive from our district leaders. And so thank you, Dr. Bryant. I needed that wind in my sails. And in conclusion, I also wanted to mention how encouraged I was to attend the AIM conference held in North Carolina by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction in Raleigh, November the 29th to December the 1st. The highlight of that experience for me was to see the unveiling of the new North Carolina State Board of Education 2025 statewide strategic plan. Therein, I saw initiatives and emphases that are near and dear to my heart. Among them, goal number one, eliminate opportunity gaps by 2025 by addressing such things as exclusionary discipline practices that affect students differently by subgroup, increase the number of educators of color in schools across North Carolina, and provide equitable access to economically disadvantaged students. And goal number three, which addresses educator preparedness, and in particular, objective one of goal number three, increase the number of culturally relevant, equity-focused resources and training for, for educators. I am super excited for what this means for students of color in particular, but more so what this means for us as an entire community. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'll just say something real quick. I was with, I was sat behind Katie and Eric and uh, at the League of Women Voters event. And Dr. Bryant, what did he speak for, 45 minutes? 45 minutes without an um, without a stutter, <laughs> without looking, without notes. I mean, I'm telling you, this guy is good. And it was a great, I mean, just a good job. Great job. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Miss Courtney McCall. Ms. McCall. Segregating students based on age, race, and mass choice, sexual ideation clubs in middle school, books with pornographic content in our school libraries, teachers targeting students because of differing political or religious views, taking a month to respond to parent requests and questions with sometimes no response at all, Quarantining healthy students for weeks at a time and forcing our kids to wear masks for almost 200 days now. What's happened to our county? For years, people have been proud of our school board and our county office and how well they've worked with parents and our students. Now it seems we have kids being pulled out of school on a weekly basis. I personally know of two families in the last two weeks that have pulled their kids out. What does it say about us that parents feel they have no choice but to take their children out of public school and find a way to homeschool them? It tells me that they can't trust our school system. When the majority of parents and teachers agree on an issue, and by your own words, they were the majority, and you still ignored their pleas to let parents make the best decision for their kids, what does that say about us? There's nothing new that I haven't already said in the last six school board meetings, but I won't stay silent. I can't stand by while I see my students, as well as my own child, lose their love for school. And I won't stay silent when I have fellow teachers tell me, please keep speaking up for us, because I don't have the courage to do it for myself. What does it say about us when our own county office doesn't feel the need after multiple requests by parents to apologize to our students, the ones who were most affected by the Panorama SEL debacle? How many students do we have to lose before you wake up and say, what does this say about us? Thank you. Next up, Jay Carey. Welcome, Mr. Carey. You have three minutes, sir. 
Boy, three minutes. I'm not, I'm not used to that here. It's a lot of time. First thing I wanted to do is I wanted to recognize all the school officials, teachers, people that work at the school for their dedication and their hard work, like Mrs. Gash here, and any other teachers that are here that having dedicated themselves and maintained their professionalism throughout this whole time. I know it's been very, very tough. I do appreciate that. I tell you, my children, I have two boys in school. They've greatly benefited from this, and I'm really happy to be here. So, you know, recently we've heard a lot of arguments for and against vaccines. Uh, vaccines in general, not just COVID vaccine. I don't want to just concentrate on that. Um, I'm hearing something along the lines with meningitis, that there's some issues with the meningitis vaccine, vaccine and that's, that's unfortunate. You know, I, I believe that one side, as, mo as this board does, most of us have used science. Uh, and the other sides, people that are opposed to vaccines in general, they tend to use Facebook and YouTube, and that's unfortunate. You know, I'm really happy that this board, you know, y'all have been using science and you've been maintaining that. And that's very, very important. So, you know, we, we hear different things, different ideas, different beliefs, different reasons why people believe certain things. And I just go back to what do the experts say? Uh, and most of our experts are not found on Facebook or YouTube or, or uh, TikTok and things like that. They're found in our local health communities. They're found within our school systems. We need to listen to them. Okay, I urge the board to remember that we have a very loud minority here that speaks out against certain common sense, scientific backed things. They're very loud, but they're a small group. And I urge you to let the majority of us that believe in science, believe in doing the right thing for our children and for all children as a whole, not just our children, to listen to us, to honor our views. Because we tend to be the quieter portion of that. We tend not to be as raucous. But we respect the board. We respect what y'all are doing. And we do urge you to listen to what we have to say also. You know, you, you've done a wonderful job keeping our children and our community safe, and I do appreciate it all. And uh, Mr. Craven, I was really uh, surprised it was a 7-0 instead of you saying no more for sitting on this board as the lead. But I do appreciate you being here. I appreciate you all being here. And you all have a good day. Thank you. Uh, next up is Mr. Chris Walters. Talking. Welcome back. Come on. We haven't seen you in a while. No. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I come to you as a retired middle school teacher from Flat Rock Middle School, a long time um, uh, resident of Henderson County. In fact, I went to school in this old Rose Edwards school back in the 1950s. I want to talk to you about um, history and uh, uh, learning history uh, as a community. How much is our country willing to study and educate itself about our history? I have some history here I'll read from to you. During the last years of the Civil War, as enslaved African people were emancipated, they began looking for their stolen children and loved ones. <clears throat> Between 1820 and 1860, approximately one million enslaved people were sold and moved from the Upper South to the Lower South as part of the slave trade. Husbands were separated from wives and children were separated from their parents and brothers and sisters. As soon as they were able, freed black people set out on foot or by whatever means they had to look for family members. They put ads in newspapers telling where they were last seen, what their names were, who they were sold to, desperately trying to find them. These ads have been recovered from black newspapers and they show that even 50 years after emancipation, some formerly enslaved people were still searching for loved ones. There are over 900 of these ads now digitalized and archived. I don't know if there's any account of how many of the newly freed blacks never saw their children again and how many children never reunited with their families. Even though they were emancipated, they were still left with grievous loss of family <clears throat> and loved ones. I got this information from a publication of the National Park Service at Carl Sandburg home about Reconstruction Era and also from an NPR program. When I was a teacher, I never thought about this because I was not aware of it. Of course, I knew that enslaved were sold and their families broken up and separated but I never thought of the fact that after they were emancipated, they might spend years, even decades, looking for their lost family members. If I were still an eighth grade teacher, um, I would, I would um, 
that bit of compelling information is something I would share in some way with my students. I would put it under the heading of bad check. As Martin Luther King said in his famous 1963 speech, America has defaulted on the promissory note of rights guaranteed by the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. America has given the Negro people a bad check, he said, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. We've never had a formal Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country, so we don't have a shared body of knowledge about our history of slavery, the, Recon Re the Reconstruction era, Jim Crow, and the influence of today's of that history on today's society. It looks as though we'll have to do that work ourselves. We can read, study, listen, and process that information. That's everyone's responsibility in the community, not just the responsibility of the school system. Uh, how are we helping? What, what have we learned about race? How do we find out accurate information? Why is it important? How can we share that with others? Taking those questions seriously would be a good place to start with getting to the truth. We can't have full reconciliation without getting to the full truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Um, our, last, our last comment will be uh, Ms. Amber Cox. Welcome. Good afternoon, administration, board members. I appreciate your time. I'm Amber Cox. I'm in the uh, mother of a very precocious 10-year-old at Hendersonville Elementary. And you can see, I'm not a little person. Last Monday morning, my daughter had a complete meltdown in the car rider line. And I just walked across the parking lot with her. Wasn't dragging her. We got in the school. We have an amazing counselor at Hendersonville Elementary, Samantha Blythe. Honey, do you not want to go to school because mama's working remotely? Hmm. Miss Blythe got down on Kellen's level. She said, what's really going on? I don't want to go to school because I have to wear a mask. I'd rather just sit at home. She's in fourth grade. She's already asked me when she can drop out of school. She makes the AB honor roll. She's smart and she's loving. This kid got the citizenship award and she's on the autism spectrum. She has anxiety and she does have some issues, but she was voted by the teachers at Hendersonville Elementary last year to get the citizenship award, which is a big deal at Hendersonville. And it shows how much progress she has made. Our kids are floundering. And I have heard that from several people on this board in multiple meetings. Ms. Blythe and Hendersonville Elementary are putting calm down boxes in every classroom in that school. If you guys aren't disturbed about what's going on with these children, I can't help you. But you need to go take a walk around a school. And it's not just the masks. This world is turned upside down right now. And school is the one place most of these kids are safe and fed and loved. And that's what we need to be worrying about. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. That's the end of our public comment portion today. Um, we will move on to consent agenda. I will take a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, any discussion? Okay. Mr. Bridges, yes or no, consent agenda? Uh, yes or no uh, to approve the consent agenda? Yes. Uh, Ms. Case? Yes. Ms. Holt? Yes. Ms. Regoff? Yes, sir. Dr. Revis? Yes. Ms. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, past the 7 -0. We have no old business today, so we'll move on to new business. We have already um, taken care of Part A in new business, the current face covering guidance and policy. So we're going to move on to the Bernie Show. Approval of the 2021-2022 initial budget. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Let's pretend it is June 1st. Okay. 
and we're approving a July 1st budget. You know, I think <laughs> this, this is the first time we've actually had a budget in how many years? Three, Three years from the state. So we can actually put some real numbers, some, some pen to paper here. Yes, um, th that is very exciting. Good. <laughs> there are some changes in the budget this year that have, um, as people have said, have been long overdue. So we're very happy about that. Um, and it's still coming, even though it is December. Um, we're still getting information, so there's a, there'll be some changes coming up in the future that we'll have to do some amendments on, but we want to get this to you as soon as we could. Sure. Um, so what we have is the 2021-22 um, initial budget. Again, this is July 1 is when this goes back effective to. Um, it is essentially, from a local perspective, what we talked about in the spring from our local budget with adjustments based on what the state has now done. Now that they've given us a salary benefit increases, we've been able to apply those um, as best we know to this point to come up to adjust our local as we needed to. Um, so I don't have an answer to know exactly what that local impact's gonna be yet, because we're still waiting on... <laughs> Two pieces here and there. They're still arguing about the retirement rate. Sure. <laughs> um, but if you wanna, um, I guess, do I need to... It's just to, to scroll down. <laughs> Can you make that bigger? Okay. Oh, yeah, there you go. So just some, some visuals for you to kind of look at where we, where we are and where we were um, a year ago, recognizing that we are now in a fully operational <laughs> school this year compared to last year. And first thing I want to draw your attention to, as you probably may notice, um, there's a big increase from last year. And it's almost all in one line that is in the federal grants fund, that is ESSER two and ESSER three. That is a two and a three year budget that we are given. We do not anticipate spending all of that this year, but we are required to include that in our budget. We had to submit budgets and get approval. So it kind of skews the numbers a little bit, but just realize that that additional $31 million is not gonna get all spent by June 30. So I wanted to, point that one out because you probably would have had a, a question of, hey, we <laughs> <That laughs> spend all that? Yeah. Um, the other increases that you know we have in there, the, the state public school fund increase, that is salary and benefit increases. That's primarily what that is, that is showing there. Um, local current expense and other restricted funds, we have, we got an extra million dollars locally. We are able to collect indirect costs on the increase to the federal budget. So that also, that's part of that 1.8 million, it's um, another 400 plus thousand dollars of that is gonna be an indirect cost that come into our local budget from the federal dollars. Um, the enterprise funds, child care is double. <laughs> no other way to put it then, it's double what it was. It's, um, and that is partly due to increased participation in the program, Solid as well leadership. as a lot of um, COVID dollars that are coming our way. Solid leadership, and I, hats off to, to Mr. Rhodes on turning that thing around. Uh, and child nutrition, another increase. Again, we are in full operational mode now with students back in school. We are, participation is actually higher this year, and so are the costs. <laughs> the, the, the food costs, in fact, when we were building the budget, I was a little surprised <laughs> at how much it would gone up. Um, but yeah, the, the food costs, which fortunately for us also matches up with reimbursement for FDA. So we, it's not costing us more. Um, we're getting reimbursed increased as well. So that is the increase to the um, enterprise fund. And the capital outlay fund, we actually are $400,000 less, but we have some carryover. How much is retro active to July 1 um, on salary specifically from the state? Like, what, what are we looking at for a number there? That we don't know yet. They're still telling us. They haven't figured out yet exactly how they're going to tell us how to pay that. Is there going to be a 2.5% raise and a 2.5% raise, but we're going to retro that back to July 1, but yet we don't know how to pay for it yet? Um, yeah, and that goes back to the to retirement system. It. So they're, yeah, the, Sweet. the cost of that is going to come into the retirement rate that they give us. So is this going to be, did I read right that it's going to be in January when they get that reimbursement from January? I mean, from July 1, it'll be this year? No, 
they get like a COVID. So, so the new salary schedules, which yes, on average are two and a half percent increases right. across the board, are retroactive back to July one. Um, they will go into effect with their January paychecks yeah, or the new pay rates. Bad. There are a, a list of bonuses um, for staff that are also going to be paid in January. Then um, we have our retention bonus that we're going to be paying in February. <laughs> um, and at that, in that time frame, we are going to begin the calculation of the retro retroactive payments back to July 1, and we will begin by group um, in pay cycles. To, we'll start including those probably in the February and the March paychecks is when they will receive the retroactive payment. But the important parts are going to be the new salary and the bonuses. Those are going to be the larger components. I just worry about tax-wise. That just puts them up. You know, like it would, I mean, I know it's not you. I know it's the state isn't giving us those numbers, so we can't pay them out in Jan and December in the 2021 tax year. It, they're just going to be hit, and I, I'd rather give it to them than not, you know, but they're going to be hit January, February, March, and then 2022, they're going to be paying a higher tax rate as opposed to if they'd have been able to have 2021 stuff in 2021. But I know we can't control that. The retro should be less than the bonuses that they're going to be receiving in January and February. Yes. And so, yeah, that's going to, that's definitely going to be a concern. But the retro shouldn't be that much. That is going to create that much of a bump um, in March or April or whenever. That Correct. Is. And that's you know part of the thing that would be helpful if it does end up being March. That would be the only add-on to their paycheck at that time. It'll be, they'll spread it out. Yeah. Um, they'll get their first regular paycheck in April. <laughs> okay. Bernie, explain how they determine how much of that $100 million or whatever is going to go to supplements. How did they determine how much each county was going to get? The, the low wealth supplement, is that the one you're referring to? No, I'm talking about the teacher supplement that, uh, that each, uh, each system got a certain amount of money out of that, I think it was $100 million I read off that education thing. Okay, so there is one of those, yes, there is um, where we will be paying um, $1,000 to teachers and instructional support. No, that wasn't it. Not that one? Else. It was like 700 and... Uh... Specific to that one, Mrs. Case, I know which one you're referring to. There were only five counties that were not eligible for it. It's additional okay. funds that go on top of the local supplement, and it was relative to your property tax rate, the tier that your county exists, and where your current supplement is, and so... They calculated all that and then provided an estimate to local school systems for what each ours would be. So we have the fifth lowest supplement in the state, in the state, but yet we got the like the twenty fourth lowest uh, amount of money for that. How come? Are we oh, rich? Our tax, tax, our tax, tax rate, rate is rate. so low. It's based on the tax rate and the low wealth formula. The medium, the medium that applies. You can come in, in your yeah, county. which is why we don't usually get the low wealth. There's a low wealth allotment. That districts yeah, get. We, we do not qualify based on our tax rate and property values. And if I could just echo something I heard Mrs. Holt say, because Mr. Sosha and his team are exceptional, this is the challenge of when a budget gets approved, uh, you know, in November, yeah. and then trying to, the devil is in the details. You know, we have almost 2,000 full and part-time employees. And so every one of those is a different circumstance and a different situation as those things are applied. And so the state actually directed public school systems to not move to the new salary schedules until January 1st. We weren't even allowed to utilize. They didn't publish those schedules. So that first part that he's speaking to starts January 1. The bonuses that are explicitly stated in legislation are going to be paid at that period of time. But calculating the retro pay is a no small task yeah. uh, across the board given the circumstances. And so we're going to work as efficiently as we can, but it's certainly one of the challenges that we'll face. Our supplement has already been given out to the teachers? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Mm -hmm. The increased supplement that this board approved, and as Mr. Sosha mentioned, the retention bonus that this board also approved will be paid to all employees in February. And the supplement is November and May, June, November and June. Yeah, and today, paychecks were actually printed today. So to have gotten any of it, we would have had to have. Yeah, you had, had it, it had it two months ago. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, the short month. 
this is essentially going to be a working document as you and your team are trying to get through the budget, trying to figure out all the crossing the T's, dotting the I's, making sure that we're on the right path, essentially. Yes, sir. Um, but I, I will say that um, I'm going to give credit to Charlie Livingston, and our budget analyst, who has been just, she just dove into this. As every piece of information has come out. So the accuracy of this, hopefully long term, because you know, is, is going to be very good. Um, we've applied all the information that we could and just dug in to get this current and not just with prior to last week. The retirement rate that, again, they're still arguing about, even though it was in the budget <laughs> bill. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can't figure that one out. <laughs> Does anyone have, do you have anything else that you're digging? No, uh, if, you have, if you have questions, please. Let's. Ms. Kasky, any questions on the budget um, as presented here? Nope. I'm good. All right, and we will have revisions monthly as they come along, um, and I'm sure they're going to be hot and heavy for at least the first couple of months, um, and then probably as we get closer to June uh, to get that budget um, done. So if there aren't any questions, um, would like someone like to make a motion? I move we approve the budget as presented, the budget resolution. Is presented. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, voice vote again. Mr. Bridges. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, Ms. Case? Yes. Ms. Holt? Yes. Mr. Egolf? Yes, sir. Dr. Revis? Yes. Mrs. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. 7 out. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you for all the work yeah. that you guys do. You guys put in some work. We appreciate it. Yep. All right, next up, substitute teacher and bus driver recruitment and incentive plan. So excited. Mr. Scott Rhodes. Well, thank you, members of the board. I'm excited to come to you this evening to present to you a, a plan for our substitute teacher and bus driver recruitment, uh, Ms. Molly McGowan-Gorsuch. Here by me, we have been working uh, collaboratively during the month of November to come up with this plan. And uh, Ms. Holt, I think you mentioned in the last board meeting uh, a need. And, and I, I want to say to you that we've actually recognized um, this uh, ongoing issue with substitutes and bus drivers uh, since early October. And so we committed ourselves into the month of November to be able to put this plan together. And so with that being said, I want to go ahead and get started. So we really always want to identify what, what is the purpose? Now, why are we getting ready to go down this road? And our purpose behind this is we're wanting to try to increase the field rates for substitute teachers in Henderson County. What I mean by field rate is when we have a teacher who's absent, making sure we have a qualified sub filling in for that teacher that day so we keep a continuity of instruction. Can, hey, can you tell us, because I've had a ton of questions this last month, what, what are the qualifications for a substitute and what is the qualifications for a bus driver? Because okay, there's we'll a lot of people here, asking. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll have to come back to that one. Okay. We've got that one, but I'll come okay. right back to you. And so uh, the increase of the fill rate for the substitute teachers in Henderson County, but at the same time, we've recognized the number of bus drivers and the vacancies that we have in our bus drivers. And so when we start thinking about that, why is that important? Well, I would argue with you that workforce stability right now is one of the most important issues that we're facing as a school system. And we're not immune to this, and anyone else who's uh, working in business recognizes that workforce stability is an issue throughout the country. We're asking uh, our folks to do a lot of different things. For example, we're asking teachers not only to teach, but they're covering classes, they're driving buses. We have teacher assistants who are filling in, who are driving buses, and doing a lot of different uh, substitute uh, assignments as well. So workforce stability is an issue. So when we start thinking about substitute teachers, one of the issues we want to bring to your attention is fill rates. In October of 2021, the substitute fill rate at Henderson County Public Schools is 53%. That means 53% of the time we have a qualified sub filling in for a teacher who is absent. The national average is 57%. When we look at pre-pandemic in October of 2019, uh, substitute fill rates for our district were 84% and the national average was 78%. So when we start thinking about this being an issue, we have also have issues where teacher assistants, especially in our elementaries, are being pulled when we have uh, a teacher who is absent and we don't have a sub to fill in that day. 
In, in the month of October, we had 253 teacher absences where teacher assistants had to fill in for that teacher who was absent. Now, when we start thinking about that, that equals 2,024 missed hours of instructional support. So when you start thinking about a first grade classroom who uses that teacher assistant to work with small groups in reading, and that teacher assistant is being pulled to go and have to substitute, well, that creates issues. Now, the good news for the teacher assistant, they are paid, just so you know, that day they are paid on base teacher pay at base zero zero, which means I think it ends up being $162 a day. So the teacher assistant does make more money that day, but again, the missed instructional support. So we started thinking about, okay, what kind of strategies can we use to address this issue? Because we know there's a crisis when we start thinking about what we're asking our, our people to do. So the first thing we, we came up with, uh, Ms. McGowan, Gorsuch, and myself, we decided that we were going to put a survey together. Because it's not just enough to think that you know what the issues are, but we needed some data to help support what we were trying to accomplish. And when we sent out this survey, we had a list of questions, but the, one of the main questions we asked was, why are you not subbing? And so the top three reasons that came back was, number one, pandemic. A lot of people still didn't feel safe going back into the classroom. The second issue was pay. And the third issue, a lot of our substitutes, because of the shutdown when we were in Plan C, they had went out and found other jobs. So those are the top three issues that we we're facing. So then we started thinking about creating a bonus pay structure till the end of this school year using ESSER funds. So using federal dollars to create a structure where if we have a substitute is working five to nine days, then we would incentivize that by paying them $200 extra a month. And then if we had substitutes who are working 10 or more days, then we would incentivize that by paying them $400 extra a month. This plan is in alignment with some of the other school systems. I would love to tell you that I come up with all these numbers by myself, but uh, Ms. McGowan, uh, Gorsuch, and myself looking at other school systems like Charlotte Mech and trying to gauge something that we would be able to uh, come up with that would be fair to our employees. Now, one of the byproducts of this, I want to remind you, substitute teachers do not fall in line when it comes to the retention bonus. They are not considered full-time or part-time employees. But this pay structure would go into effect till the end of the school year. And we would be able to look at it and ask ourselves, would this have approved, would this move the needle to help support our teachers and also support our students? And if so, this would be about five months. So if we had a substitute teacher who decided to work 10 or more days, increase the number of our fill rates, they could earn up to $2,000 in that five-month span, which is equal to what a retention bonus would be for us. The same thing if they worked only half the time and could earn $1,000 that would be equal to someone as well who was working part-time. Some other good news from the budget, and Mr. Sosha talked about our substitute teacher pay, there's going to be an increase that comes with the budget starting January 1st. That non-certified rate is going to go up $11 from $80 a day to $91, and also the non-certified or the certified rate is going to go from $103 to $110. So with that being said, uh, one of the, 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 I want to really brag on uh, Ms. Molly McGowan Gorsuch just for a second. We really talk about everything we do here in Henderson County, we want to do it one way, first class, period. And working with her and working to put this together, we really started thinking about we need to be able to market this as well. And so I want her to come up and talk to you about our marketing campaign that she has led, and I'll turn this over to Ms. McGowan Gorsuch. Good evening. The plan that we have put together is the We Need You in 2022 recruitment campaign designed to roll out in January 2022. And it is threefold. It covers a lot of different areas in an effort to really reach the different groups in our community who may or may not already be aware of the crisis. A lot of folks who are tuning into the, to the news and may follow us on social media know of a national crisis, know that it may be affecting us locally, but certain ways that we can reach them um, and put our materials in their hands may reach individuals who aren't as tuned in. So initially, we are going to um, explore doing recruitment videos, identifying spokespersons that are our own bus drivers and substitute teachers. The purpose of that is not just 
illustrating all the perks and the upcoming incentives that are proposed, but also identifying the reasons that these individuals find value in their roles and continue to keep coming back. So that was another reason that that survey was useful for us because we were able to identify those folks who really truly have a heart for this and are able to speak to others about why that's important to support the community during this time. So those videos would not only be shown on our YouTube, would be uploaded to YouTube, it would also be going onto our website, which to your, po uh, your point, Ms. Holt, we are in the process of also revamping to make it easier and clearer to individuals who are wanting to apply to this for this role um, to see exactly what the requirements are. In addition to that, they would be posted on social media as we do with any of our videos, but specifically regarding uh, social media, instead of just doing the organic posts, which is 99% of what we already do, we would also be investing in targeted ads. So the difference between that is um, if you follow us right now, you're going to see Henderson County Public Schools in your newsfeed because you're a follower. But that does not mean, that's called organic reach. What that does not reach are individuals who aren't already following us and tapped in. So by using the different um, demographics and the uh, targeted approach through the social media advertisements, you're able to specifically tap into individuals and a target audience based on behaviors, demographics, not just location, but connections. So finding those individuals who would really maybe be interested in driving um, a bus or coming to substitute. Uh, and, and then additionally, those videos would be shared also by QR code in direct mail ads. And the idea of direct mail is that it would reach those folks in the community who, like I said, may not have that access, that digital access already. The idea is to have a um, two-sided uh, flyer, to not just flyer, but um, sorry, the direct mail ads a little bit larger, it stand out. Um, and the idea there is that it's going to uh, reach about 5,000 individuals and based on U United States Postal Service routes. And the nice thing about that is we can choose those routes specifically based on our needs. And if in the future we decide to redo a campaign, we know exactly which routes have been used so that we don't have to double back on our efforts, we can reach new individuals. So if you have any questions about these different uh, avenues that we've looked at, uh, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk more about them. Thank you. All right, Mr. Rhodes, bottom dollar. How much are we looking to spend here? Hold on, we're not down. <laughs> oh, we gotta wait for the, yeah, wait for the click. For click. We're getting close. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're good. Okay. Mr. Bridge, I wouldn't be able to answer the question how it would compare to other school districts. But if the field rates are they're pretty much in line compared to other uh, school systems across the nation. Um, and so with that being said, it, it really just depends on the number of days that a person and an individual decides they want to work. When we sent out the uh, survey, 86% of the people who responded said that it would be an incentive for them to work more to be able to earn the bonus, whether it be $200 or $400 based off the approval of the board. The byproduct of being able to use the ESSER funds, I don't want to say this is free money, but it is not local dollars. This is federal money that we would be able to use in the short term to see if this would actually move the needle and help increase the fuel rates or the transportation rates within our school system. Uh, I do have some numbers for you, uh, just as an example. If we were to use the month of October, uh, just as an example, it would have cost us about $18,000 um, out of ESSER funds to be able to fund uh, that bonus program. That month, we had 27 of our substitutes who worked between five and nine days, and we had uh, 26 substitutes who worked 10 or more. And again, every opportunity that we get to put someone else in that is every time we raise those fill rates, that means that's a teacher assistant who is getting to stay in the classroom, it's a teacher or that when we are able to put a sub in a high school that's going to be a qualified sub. And so the investment, I know it seems like it may be large as we get ready to go through the end of the year, but again, using these, these federal funds really gives us an opportunity to do the targeted social media ads, the recruitment videos, 
And I, and I just want to say this, okay? All right, I don't want to get taking my watch and ring off, but this is kind of the point where I really want to start doing that, right? <laughs> it's no different than child care, period. We know something has to change. In the absence of doing nothing, we know what we're looking at, 53%. And unfortunately, as I, I went back and I started looking at uh, getting prepared to come up here, I went and looked at November. It's 52%. And then I kept hearing that song, that country song about uh, Grandpa, tell me about the good old days. I started looking back at 2019 and 2018, and we were a 90% fill rate. And so we know we've got these challenges because of the pandemic, but I really do believe that, again, this targeted campaign that Ms. McGowan Gorse has worked on, that we've worked on together, is going to be something that I can't guarantee it's going to work, but I can guarantee it's not going to work if we don't do something. And so with that being said, here's kind of a couple teaser graphics. Will you be my son? Oh, she's cut half off. There's a, there's a picture that comes along with that. She's Not holding the same sign, just so you know. There it is. Oh, there he is. You be my son. Yeah, but it's not just about substitute teachers. We've got another need, folks, and it's bus drivers. As of December 2nd, my son's birthday, by the way, 27 bus drivers. That's how many positions we had open in Henderson County. So we've addressed this in the same way, looking at a bus driver survey, and it's it's amazing, the top three reasons that bus drivers aren't driving, same three reasons for substitutes. The pay, the pandemic, and they have found other jobs. So again, looking at the developing we need you in 2022, what we're saying to bus drivers is we average about 20 days a month. A typical month is 20 days. That means driving a.m. and p.m. would total 40 routes, okay? So when we start thinking about a trip, one trip is a.m., another trip is p.m., so you could total up to 40. If you drive 10 to 19, no matter who you are, you get 50 extra dollars. 20 to 29 would be 100. 30 plus trips is 200. And I'll go ahead and tell you right now, I have no idea what that would cost. I cannot tell you that because it's hard to kind of pull that data right now, but we would be able to monitor that and look at it in the first couple months and we would be able to have an idea of what that may cost us. We would start this in January of 2022. The good news is that starting pay for bus drivers is going to go up to $13 an hour because of the new budget from the state. That's still not where we would want it to be, but it is better than where it was. And where is it now? I'm sorry. Uh, what is the exact starting pay? I would have to go to the chief financial officer. If we don't know, that's okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. For $2 more. And so, again, we're going to do the recruitment videos, the social media targeted ads, just like we're doing for substitute teachers, we're doing the exact same thing for bus drivers, the direct mail ads as well. And here again, here are some teaser graphics of what we're putting together. We be my bus driver. Oh, cool. You'll probably get more bus drivers. I know, right? <laughs> so just doing some quick math. So right. if you have, we have 120 buses, right? 111, all right, so for easy math, I did 120 real quick. Um, double that, that's 240 routes a day-ish, right? Um, at the three, what was it, 30 plus trips is $200? So that's 48,000 for the month? No, if you think about 111 buses, if they all had a full-time driver, they would all earn 30 plus trips. If they were all entirely covered, it'd be $22,000 a month. Okay. So this this is incentivized so, pay structure, the 1500 and 200 It's for any bus driver, current or a substitute, correct? Yeah, so the, so the purpose behind that is, is really kind of twofold. One, we're trying to incentivize folks to come in off the street and want to become bus drivers. So we're going to give them a, a reason to want to do that. The second thing is I'm going to repeat the words of Dr. Jan King. If you're watching at home, I'm sorry that you're watching this. You should have something else better to do. <laughs> But like she always said, and there's nothing that uh, says I appreciate you more than a paycheck. And so being able to take care of those people who are driving buses, whether they're the teacher or the teacher assistant, who are doing this out of the goodness of their heart, not to mention the assistant principals and the administrators that we have driving. Yep. Folks, every morning on my way to work, I see at least two to three administrators passing me going back to Flat Rock Middle School in Hillendale, coming from my house to work. And so giving those folks a reward doing this job is the purpose and again to get people who would be willing to come in and become bus drivers as well now, I think we have to do something clearly I mean something has to be done um, I would like to know uh, wham, 300 grand 400 grand 
five hundred grand, what is the number going to be max out of pocket? That because we're about to talk about ESSER funds, I, I, I'm fine with spending the money because clearly it's a need, right? And that's what the ESSER funds were. That's the purpose. Yes, sir. Um, but I would love to have some. This is the most that we could probably spend on this program altogether. If everybody's getting two hundred bucks and we fill every position, I know that's not going to happen. But every substitute, I would love for it to happen. What is that number? And and that's the one place we wanted to be cautious again. I know that we have the resources available to us to cover it for the remainder of the year. And as Mr. Rhodes sent, as it relates to us being able to report to you each month what the earning is to be able to project that out, because they are both frequency based incentives, sure. we can. As you said, you might look that large scale and say, okay, yeah. you may spend $100,000 in bus driver incentives. Right. You may spend X amount. We, we want to be able to communicate that to you. We know that when you're talking, Esser, and I'll report on that in just a few minutes, you're talking about an ability to adjust that plan as we go. Uh, Mr. Rhodes and Ms. Magali, Molly McGowan Gorsuch, who are working on this, are really trying to say, does this move the needle? And if it does, what's it going to cost us to consider it? Because as you well know, these ESSER dollars are available to us between now and 2024. So these may be bridge resources and strategies that help us short term. They may help us long term. But we will make an, an, a monthly reporting that helps us understand what that impact is going to be. And what does the marketing cost? What, what, are, we, what are we spending? to um, reach those folks? We've actually budgeted $7,500 to be able to do the marketing cost. And so we believe that we'll be able to do that and do it successfully. And that's to produ produce, print, mail the pieces that you're going to send to the... All in, yes, sir. Because that's the most expensive piece of that, right? Facebook targeted ads aren't going to cost you that much. Yes, actually, the, the most expensive part will always be the video generally what you're going the industry standard is you're going to be paying about a thousand dollars per minute of professionally produced video but we're coming in under that um, thanks to a good partnership we have with Rhodes branding um, but then also yes the direct mail costs would include I'm handling the design in-house so that would include local printers servicing of printing postage banding sorting getting to the USPS and then getting it on the trucks and out into the routes so Just for fun facts, just so that there's no questions, Rhodes Branding. It's a great last name. It's a great But for last anyone name. out there who thinks that that has anything to do with Scott Rhodes, it I, does not. I believe Miss Caskey is off. Is she back on now? We're having we're having problems again. I'm here. Oh, you're there. I can there hear you. Go. you. Okay, good. So can you tell us what the qualifications are for a substitute and a bus driver um, so that we can kind of get that word out as well? Yeah, so when we start talking about substitute teachers, the main thing is that they have to have at least 48 hours of college credit or an associate's degree. And so if someone's interested in becoming a sub, they can go on our website. We're going to be making this a lot easier for folks to be able to go online. Uh, we're going to have icons for them to be able to click on our banner starting tomorrow. Once they go on, it will take them to another page if they want to be a sub uh, or they want to be a bus driver. So again, substitute 48 hours or an associate degree, they would need to have a principal. They would need to call one of their schools that they would like to sub at, have the principal do a recommendation into the HR department, and it will lead them and guide them on the website of the steps that they would need to take. Okay. And once they do that, we would take them through the intake process. As far as the bus driver, they would have to have their CDLs. They would have to go through the bus driving class. They would have to go through uh, being drug tested. Uh, they would also have to have a, a physical that's required uh, by DMV now. And then we just finished up a bus class, Mr. Taylor, I believe this past week. Do we know when the next bus class is? And do we pay for that? We, pro we provide reimbursements for that. Uh, employees or prospective employees have to pay for those costs up front and the successful completion of it, and then we provide reimbursements. Okay. Mr. Bridges. Do you do background checks on substitute teachers and bus drivers? Yes, sir, all employees. We make sure we do background checks. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Now, we just had a bus class, you said? How many people? I believe we had 11 individuals. They used this space, and they were very appreciative of the board uh, allowing the, creating this space for that type of professional learning to occur. I know the hard thing about the CDLs is that you can go drive a dump truck for 20 22 bucks an hour. Um, haul an asphalt or aggregate material to 26 to try to you know get the road fixed and so um 
hopefully this can help bridge that gap a little bit um, to have you know this precious commodity be driven around. It's hugely important. Um, we had to reboot the computer again. Um, Matthew's working on it. Technical diff. It's a Monday. One thing I want to say while we're doing that, I'm sure you guys have, have thought of this, uh, but marketing is, is a lot. And I went up to our employees one time and I said, how about you take $10 out of each car you sell and I'll give it to you at, at the end of the year. And they're like, $10? That, that's not going to do anything. And I said, okay, let's say, let's say you sell 10 cars a month. That's $100, you know, times 12 months. That's $1,200. And just give it out at the end, and they're like, "Okay, now that's a lot of money." So I would, you know, just if you if someone took two trips and the two extra dollars, and you wrote how many hours and what they could make. I mean, it, that's that's a good bit of money, from especially from where it was. So I, I don't want people to think that's chump change because that that does mean something. That would that that could probably that's going to bring you some people. You know, the fact that North Carolina has this shortage of bus drivers overall. Has the state ever, ever considered um, looking into the fact that student drivers are a possibility like we used to have years ago? Careful. You know, Mr. Bridges, again, that country song comes up in my my head. Tell me about the good old days. I, I don't I don't foresee that ever happening again. Never again. Uh, yeah, we, you know, I, I can remember riding the bus and a 17-year-old student uh, drove me on bus 15 from oh my gosh. Pilot Mountain Road to Eddieville. Thank goodness it was only two miles. I can go there. Uh, but yeah, I, I've not heard that discussed. I bet parents would walk with their kids. <laughs> there's, there's no way. Um, I wouldn't let my son drive anybody to school, and I love him. Good. Um, Ms. Caskey, are you back with us? I am. Hey. Okay. Do you have any questions about this? <laughs> no, I think I think I heard about 90 percent of it. Right. Very good. Uh, do you have a, can you go to the motion page? Are you going to say something? I was going to echo your point. If you kind of do the base math on the substitute incentive, if you're making the flat rate plus the bonus for doing 10, you're almost making the daily rate for teacher. You're exactly right. It is a lot of money. If you start talking about $160, $150 a day. It, it is far more significant than those other pieces. And so if you break out that math, um, I really applaud Mr. Rhodes's effort and, and their continued conversations around how we, we take a stab at moving this forward because our students deserve it and our teachers deserve it. The demands and the coverage are significant. Um, and being able to pr provide uh, a solution that we can monitor and then determine if it moves the needle, great. We can continue, expand, target. Uh, but it certainly would incentivize the people that were choosing to do that. Yes, sir. I just ask that, you know, this is needed. Make sure you guys are keeping us abreast of what this is costing. Um, yes, for sure. I don't like the blank check aspect of it, but I know it is a dire need that we need to have right now. Um, yeah, most definitely. And I look forward to being able to keep up with those numbers, especially as we get into the first two months, and to be able to bring that back to you. Uh, because hopefully, if we are spending a lot of money, that means we're having some success. Yeah. That would be the byproduct. So, yes, that would be great. All right, if anybody would like to make a motion, I will gladly accept it. I couldn't find. I can't see it either. Will you make that bigger? Yeah, that's because I can't read it. Yeah, because I couldn't find it on the. Make it bigger and scroll thing. up. There you go. I right. move that the Henderson County Board of Public Education approve the substitute teacher and bus driver recruitment and incentive plan as presented. Second. I second that. Oh. <laughs> Got beat. You got beat. Um, <laughs> Mr. Bridges, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Ms. Case? Yes. Ms. Holt? Yes. Uh, Ms. Dreekoff? Yes, sir. Dr. Revis? Yes. Uh, Ms. Kasky? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Past 7 -0. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we go on to board superintendent reports, return to learn. We've already uh, been through that. So next is going to be the elementary and second uh, secondary school emergency relief or ESSER update. Dr. Bryant. Thank you very much. And uh, members of the board, the first series of slides um, you are familiar with, but you'll have to take your memory all the way back to July at our last budget workshop when we map through these. But per the direction of the board, we do want to kind of give you an update because just as you've recently approved now as it relates to the bus driver and substitute teacher incentive pay program, you have been approving these resources and the allocation of these resources as we've been moving forward. 
Mr. Sosha shared with you that budget overview and you saw the differential between about a $40 million difference between what we have to have in our budget and the year-over-year -year data. And, and as he mentioned, that is predominantly and nearly entirely from these federal resources that are available to us, but they are intended to be stretched over an extended period of time. And so in short, this is a slide you've seen before. Remember, what does ESSER stand for? It's the Elementary and Secondary School Relief Fund. These are dollars that were allocated to state departments of education and to local public school units specifically based on uh, the direction to address our response to COVID. Um, and most specifically, they've given us guidance for how these dollars are intended to be used. As Mr. Sosha mentioned, when we talk about ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, we give them those categories. ESSER 2 expire, or those turn into a pumpkin in September of 2023, and you see all the areas in which those are eligible for their use. ESSER 3 dollars have one extra caveat associated with them, and it's 20% of those dollars have to be dedicated to addressing learning loss as it's defined in this language from uh, the federal government. So when we started talking in uh, July about how those might be used, we talked about those categories or those buckets, those targeted and strategic ways in which they might be resourced. And so we think about learning loss specifically as we think about it, recovery, acceleration and advancement, summer learning, which you're familiar with and we've talked frequently about our summer learning program. And we also talked about unassigned categories and really thinking about infrastructure, facility improvement strategies and otherwise. The unassigned one I want to talk about because again, we know we don't know what we don't know. That each time we meet, there may be a unique need that the board is seeking to address in response to, as a result of, or in prevention of future issues as we've dealt with in this space. So when you think about those big bucketed dollars, and remember, ESSER 3, we're talking about $22 million, 20% of which has to be earmarked for that learning loss piece. ESSER 2, we're talking about $9.9 .9 million. So you're talking about $30 million plus in just those two categories that are going to be leveraged for these prioritized needs. We even went so far as to think about how those could be categorized based on those specific buckets, thinking about the individual areas of eligibility that fall under each of them. So when we think about what is it that we are proposing to address those issues, you can see these <laughs> specific components associated with it. We know, as I talk about purchasing of educational technology. It is part of where we are right now. We are going to continue to have to serve and support based on hardware and software needs and the connectivity, adaptive equipment and otherwise. We talk about supplemental after school programs and the partnerships that we have, not just within school, but outside of school. Mental health services, mental, uh, Mrs. Holt mentioned earlier, as we know we're serving and supporting those specific needs. On the next two slides, again, these are familiar. We talk about summer learning. It has been a true success, the work that we did as part of House Bill 82 and the requirement to provide summer learning. But when we started talking about the academic gains that students made within that period of time, the value of how we serve and provide that level of support, we want to continue to think about how we make that success grow within the school year and outside of it. And then, of course, unassigned uh, conversations are all categories, just as we discussed. Infrastructure is specific to school facility when we think about the reduction of virus transmission or supporting student health. And then, of course, we want to always be flexible to the implementation of health protocols. And I want to give you an example that doesn't necessarily think of infrastructure in that space, but when you talk about the partnerships and the protocols, you're thinking about where this board approved the allocation of those dollars to hire additional school nurses because we prioritized coverage at all locations. So this board committed those dollars and said, you know what, we're actually going to make those dollars available so that we can ensure that we have school nurse personnel and that the health department has the ability to hire that moving forward. So if we needed, would that be acceptable then, like for us to stay if we, the health department had to hire extra CNAs or whatever? for Potentially, yes, ma'am, that's exactly right. So that last line talking about coordinating with the lo local health department, we may learn the effective strategy for test to stay is additional CNA personnel to help with the administrative task. And this board could say, okay, it's important to us to make that initiative successful and we're willing to allocate X amount of dollars for that personnel. Yes, ma'am, that's a perfect example. When we think about three in our July presentation, we really tried to break this out by category and think about it from a budget number. We know all budgets are flexible, and again, we have to continue to stay uh, malleable in that way. But you see these dollar figures that are attached to that as a way of making those decisions based on the needs and making those decisions based on the needs over time. 
what I want you to see on this particular slide is the additional allowable uses that are relative to consideration for this forward. And I bring this slide up because I think it's helpful to see what is present all the time, because this is the language of the allocation from federal funding. You can address air quality. You can provide principals and school leaders with resources. You can improve the preparedness and response, provide training, supplies, and materials. That has been a huge lift for us during this period, as well as prepare for long-term closure activities. And we certainly hope that's not necessary moving forward. To date, where have those dollars been allocated already? And this is a really important slide for both the board and the public. One, we talked about legislated summer learning and expending a significant amount of dollars in that space. This board approved retention bonuses, again, paid in February of 2022, 1,000 for full-time personnel or 2,000 for full-time personnel, 1,000 uh, for part-time personnel. Huge dollar figure there. We're talking about in excess of $3 million. Additional school nurse positions, and you approve those five positions moving forward over the three-year period of the eligibility of funds, and we know that people tend to be our most expensive. We are teacher assistants to support quarantine students. That 23 is one associated with every individual school. That's a full-time person that's providing that support. We have specific curriculum support resources and materials that are being provided across the board and bus driver overtime pay that's outside of what you just approved to this point. So when you look at that one slide and you think about that $40 million differential, what I want this board to recognize, that, that slide represents $10 million. $10 million of those resources. So when we talk about paying a retention bonus to our entire school system, that's a huge lift. When we talk about summer legislated learning for 20% of our population paying staff at all locations, those are huge lifts. When you start talking about hiring 23 personnel, that's a huge lift. The proposed future allocations that you are familiar with and we will talk more about as we move forward one, first bullet you just heard about, you just discussed, substitute teacher and bus driver incentive pay. We know that that's big. But we also know our core mission is instruction. So what you were mentioning at the beginning, Mrs. Holt, in, in your observations, it's about teaching, it's about learning, and it's about supporting that particular work. The state has legislated letters, professional learning for all elementary school teachers. That has to take place for all of those staff. Well. Again, those folks are essentially getting graduate level professional learning that there needs to be support for, especially coverage because they have to provide a lot, they have to do a lot of that training within the school day and outside of the school day. One of the things we've been discussing, and I want this board to have a preview slide of, is the benefit of potentially hiring individuals to provide that coverage so that teachers can do that professional learning within their work day, that we're not sending them home, we're not asking them to do it on Saturday, we're not asking them to do it on Sunday. When you think of that planning period time or creating time in order for them to have that professional learning, we have heard very loudly from our teaching staff that they need that support. You mentioned the advisory groups that we meet with. When I meet with our superintendents and teachers advisory group, they're like, you've got to provide us some support for this. We can't just add another thing. They hear us loud and clear that the state has mandated this, that we don't have, that this professional learning is necessary, but we can't just keep putting things on people's plates without taking things off of them. So we think about that. And letters professional learning is for reading? Yes, ma'am. It's early literacy. It essentially is the science of reading for all elementary school teachers. So we know its value. It is going to greatly benefit all teaching staff, but it's graduate level coursework. It is serious business. And so it's important that we provide and think about strategies to provide that support. The technology upgrades are not going to end. And I want to talk about those. You know, when we think about replacement schedules and our Chromebooks and otherwise, the needs that we have in classrooms, the ways in which we can provide the most meaningful learning resources available, we have to continue to stay current, right? That, that piece is moving, and those are, those are big ticket items, as well as one that you'll see here at the bottom that I want to talk about, because this was also the product of conversations that we've had with our teachers. There are a lot of technology uh, devices and replacement, things like the smart boards and the projectors and the um, uh, Elmos in classrooms that there is no funding for at all. These are school level fundraise expenses. These are community level fundraise expenses. And when we talk about touching every classroom, we have opportunities to think about these dollars as a way of the, the resources facilitating the learning in every space. And we know one of the things we have to think about when we talk about federal funding is funding that doesn't have a recurring responsibility. 
that when that period expires in 2024, do you have tangible evidence of resources and you're not on the hook for serious expenses moving forward? And when we think about technology in the classroom, there are opportunities there. And so I share this with you because I think it's important that we start to have regular dialogue around the proposed allocations that are here, the considered allocations, and how that money is being strategically used as we move forward with our specific needs. So I'm going to pause right there. That was a lot. Most of it you are familiar with, but I want to make this a standing superintendent's report so we have an opportunity to speak specifically about those items and answer questions about the strategic use of that work. Questions about ESSER funding, what's present, what's already allocated, and what may be on the horizon. I would just like to um, make a, a suggestion or throw an idea out there. I, I, I'm so excited that we're going to look at test test to stay programs because I think that will significantly re reduce the quarantining of asymptomatic close contact children. But I do think we're going to have children who are going to have to be quarantined because they are symptomatic and they do test positive, et cetera. Is, is there any way we could look at using some of these resources to set up some classroom pilots across our school system whereby um, teachers could be, could be videoed and that's live streamed into um, homes for quarantine students. I know, I know we talked about it many, many times, and we, and, and now I think our numbers are going to be to the point where we, we probably could do this. Actually, during Dr. Um, King's tenure, we had started a pilot program, um, and Rick was a part of that. And maybe you can touch on the technology that we couldn't get our hands on during that time, or, or how that program kind of, kind of went from there. Just on the, from a technology standpoint. We did increase um, some of the equipment in the room and worked with uh, some of the teachers in those rooms. Um, it was better. It was much better than when we started with just one IP camera and some of those things. Is it ideal? No, it still wasn't ideal. So I think there's some more things that we could do uh, to make that a better experience, given this kind of money, especially because Absolutely. we're limited on the amount of funds we had to spend before. And maybe that's something that we can look at again. We were using our teachers of the years. Um, <laughs> we didn't have like the big to do and I think 20 and um, for them. And so we spent money what we had on trying to upfit their areas. But I think that's something that we can definitely um, look forward to and see if that that can make sense. And Dr. Revis, I think to your point, kind of mapping out solutions that are innovative, especially as we look at what that pathway might look forward. So while we may reduce quarantines, I think you're exactly right. We're not going to eliminate them. They're still going to exist. And when we talk about access to content and instruction, right. we're going to be as thoughtful about that as we can. So and, we'll and continue. I particularly want to prioritize, not, not that elementary instruction is not important because I think it's extremely important. It lays the foundation. But I think where I see a lot of children and hear a lot of parents talk about their children struggling because of these long quarantines would be our high school and middle school, where that content gets so sophisticated that, you know, most parents, inclusive of myself, can't step in and support and tutor and, and help their child. So I, I would just like for us to reach out there and try to see what's out there, technologically speaking, so we can, you know, stream some, you know, instruction out to students, live instruction. Yes. Yeah, uh, you know, now that you bring that up, we looked at that video that they did. What was that video we watched last board meeting or the the meeting before where, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe it be that we're paying, we're using these funds to pay teachers, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that want to volunteer to do that. Um, over the course of, I mean, Christmas break is too soon, but, you know, if they're not going anywhere for spring break and then summer break or whatever to where they're doing, like, the Letterland lesson, you know, and that could be one thing that the parents do at home. I mean, I would like to say we're going to go away from quarantining by next year. That would be wonderful. Um, but, you know, just to be prepared if we don't, or if we have a child, you know, that is, um, yeah, homebound for, you know, any reason, and, and the, the typical math lesson that's in 
kindergarten first. I mean, I know that's a lot of things, but just kind of it would help give those kids a boost. It would just be an additional resource, and then parents could go back to it even in the evening when I know there's a lot of times, you know, I'll look at my daughter's math stuff, and it's, you know, well, I'm going to tell you to multiply by lining them up like this because that's the right way to do it. I'm not going to do this crazy stuff y'all do in school now. But it's because I couldn't teach her the other way. But if we had resources that way, um, just kind of to help with that. Most definitely. And I think what we know pre-pandemic is a really successful instructional strategy that was present was that flipped instruction is what that used to be called, that pre-recorded library mm -hmm. of resources. Right. Certainly we recognize, as you wisely mentioned, the capacity for people to add to the current load is a challenge. However, building the strategies in place that allow that, just like what we saw with the uh, phenome awareness and otherwise, like that's brilliant. And it takes our educators kind of creating those resources and that resource network. And I think over this period of time, we're broadly learning ways in which we can better do that uh, moving forward. Because we know that if you have access to that kind of content, that it's not truly independent, but there's some element of that, then we're going to likely have more success so that people don't feel like they're by themselves and on their own. So we'll continue to explore those elements. So am I understanding the quarantine correctly? We had um, 292 plus 84 out this last week, correct? Because you had 84 who were positive, they were out, and then the 292 who were quarantined. So that would be additional, like almost 300 students. Plus the week before. I mean, 400 students. Oh, so the... The week. Just last week. Yes. Because that's ro that's a rolling number because those people that, that the week were be positive before. Or you're not adding them there. back in. No, ma'am. Yeah, so we, I mean, we're having a ton. You're 500, 600 kids? Yeah, that are out. And, I mean, we got to, we got to figure something out. I don't think there's any substitute. I understand the archiving of, of videos and lessons and all that. But there is no substitute to having that live stream mm -hmm. for, for a student. And, and I know that not all teachers are up for that. Neither do they feel comfortable with it or want to do it. But I think there's, you know, there's enough teachers out there who feel comfortable enough yeah. that they would latch on to a pilot, incentivize that pilot sure. for them, and uh, see, what we can, sure. see what we can do. Agreed. Absolutely. Sweet. Other questions? All right, moving on. Construction update, Mr. Carl Taylor. Good evening, board members. I uh, hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, for our construction update, again, I will start with our largest project that we have going on, which uh, continues to be at Hendersonville High School. Uh, the work there inside of Stillwell continues to be focused around uh, the electrical plumbing rough-ins as well as the framing. But here are a couple of photos from the auditorium where uh, you can see some of that framing work taking place there as you enter into the onto the stage from that back area. But also you can see the drywall work that is taking place as well in that auditorium space. That's awesome. It is. That's going to be done in February, correct? My understanding, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, as we look outside, a couple of the projects going on out there are at the stadium where uh, footings have been poured for there for the new press box as well as new storm drain lines have been delivered. Uh, so if you drive by, you can clearly see those as well as a uh, big hole that has been dug uh, there by the visitor concession stand where they're beginning to inspect uh, the old drain lines that have been underneath that field. Next slide shows a list of just other projects that are uh, either currently taking place or will be. Uh, this will be the, the last update there on the food service freezer there at the maintenance warehouse as that work is now complete. Ms. Holt, again, you haven't called me for that tour of our I maintenance shop. So I'm emailing you right now. Picture that next time. It's big freezer. No, just a, Yes. Right. Fully stocked. Fully uh, stocked freezer. Uh, other uh, projects, again, reminders, we have uh, paving at various school sites as well as roof replacement projects. Those contracts have been awarded, and that work will take place in the spring. Uh, Rugby Middle School continues to be pending uh, two-door deliveries, and then that project can be complete. Uh, the, our warehouse there at uh, Maintenance Shop, the site has uh, been graded for that work uh, and has a target end date of June. 
Uh, also, uh, one of our MRTS projects is the video management systems to be installed in our four middle schools and in three of our high schools. Uh, that bid opening will take place this week. Uh, and so those again? That's the security camera systems that outside, will be installed. right? Inside and outside. In, oh, okay. So it's an extensive uh, upgrade at uh, those locations. Okay. Um, so that's, I know, again, that's one of those ones that principals, SROs are going to be very excited uh, once that work is complete. Sure. Uh, and then the final one with East and West Auditorium Sound and Lighting, uh, that request for proposal uh, should be posted in January and then a, a target date for that work to be completed by the start of next school year. Have some dates, though, for North uh, Henderson Apple Valley and, and our uh, boardroom here uh, in terms of the auditorium seating being replaced. Uh, for North Henderson, that's where the project will begin. So March 1st is when the demo for that existing seating is scheduled to begin. Uh, then installation of the new seats there mid-March and then anticipated completion at North Henderson at the end of March. So we look at Apple Valley for the, their auditorium seating replacement demo beginning mid-March, uh, delivery and installation at the end of the month, and then anticipated completion mid-April. And as we look at this boardroom space, uh, demo for this existing seating uh, in mid-April, delivery and installation at the end of the month, and then anticipated completion May 7th. So if all goes well, that May board meeting, uh, this space will uh, almost be complete uh, with, with the renovations. So do we anticipate more people coming to our meetings once we do that? Sure. We're going to have, you know, almost like home theater seating, so you, you never know. I'll be sitting out there. <laughs> All right. So at this time, I will uh, answer any questions that you may have. No, the construction stuff is, is awesome, especially that um, auditorium finally knocked out. But uh, who's the 2021 World Series champions? Who, who is that again? The 2021 World Series champions. Dodgers. Uh, I, believe, I believe that was the Braves, wasn't it? Okay, thank you. Yeah. The Dodgers. Hey, it. Real quick, you said I'm writing that down. <laughs> Write it down. The auditorium will be completed in February. Yes, that's yes. it. Do we have any update on the proposed or naming or anything? We are working through that right now. I will be following up with the board in, in the new year. So I've had some conversations with staff and community members and otherwise, and then focused on some other things that we sure. are addressing. Uh, but I will come back to the board with some follow up in the new year. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Now we did, was it sound at east and west as well? So that's done, and then the lighting? Uh, no, that's, no, that's, that's lighting, not done? Uh, is going to go out for proposal in January, uh, and then should be completed by the start of next school year. Okay. This summer, that, that works. That'll be, okay, gotcha. Both of those spaces are currently used as classroom spaces, and so uh, that construction is best to be completed in the summer. Okay. Lighting at north, Carl. Uh, we are waiting to receive the, the final bid or the final quotes on the lighting there at uh, North for the softball and baseball fields. Uh, so Duke Energy has had to work with Musco Lighting to look at the energy loads and then also design what that will look like at each of those sites. Uh, and so once we receive those individual uh, quotes, then uh, we will be ready to present and proceed as well. And is it upward we're still working on a single Yes, ma'am. And so that is one of the MRTS projects. And so that is on schedule to, to begin this spring. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Oh, equity update. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening. <laughs> Talking. <laughs> Good evening. It's my pleasure to share with you um, some various ways that we are working to remove barriers. Um, these are the things I'd like to bring to your attention this evening. Several of them have already been woven into previous conversations, so I think you will um, have an understanding already and awareness of, of some of these things. First of all, I want to uh, speak with you about the letters training, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. Um, I am pleased to tell you that we have folks in our district who are already participating in this ahead of schedule. Dr. Marlowe has spearheaded this. We have instructional coaches and administrators participating in this. While it is a heavy lift, I am told this is high quality professional learning and we feel that this can uh, move us forward in a very positive direction. I want to show you something. Um, this is called Scarborough's Rope, and this is really a visual for uh, the science of reading and how our teachers will be trained in helping our students learn to read. 
um, as no surprise for many of our students, reading is a challenge. And this captures the complexity of learning to read. Um, it's made up, as you see, of the lower and upper strands. And when all of these components um, intertwine, then it results in skilled and accurate fluent reading combined with strong comprehension. And, and I will tell you exactly what our folks who have participated in the training to date have told me is this is not a training you can do and multitask. So you can't be working on this training and have students that you're responsible for. You need some uninterrupted, dedicated time. And that's why I'm so pleased that we are um, um, moving towards having this position in our schools who can provide that coverage for our teachers so that they can work on this training during the workday and have complete coverage of their classes and then learning can continue in their classes. Can you tell us how, um, I was looking at this earlier today, how is this being done? Like what's the model that you're using? Um, a teacher will have a substitute that day and then so what we are examining right now, Dr. Bryant may speak about this. So uh, we are looking at dedicated full-time um, teacher assistant positions in our schools so that if I were the teacher assistant assigned to Mills River Elementary, I would have a schedule for that week. And um, each week I would provide um, 90 minutes of coverage for that elementary teacher because most of the lessons on average take from 60 to 80 minutes to complete. And that way you could count as a teacher at that school on me covering your class once that week so that you could work on that lesson. In addition to the 60 to 80 minutes of dedicated, um, concentrated time on this program. They are also given about a 20-minute bridge to practice assignment, and that can be done while you're teaching because that's where you are um, implementing what you've learned that week on students in your class, and then you're going back and reporting on it. So that's, that's the model. Does that answer your question? Yeah. How many okay. teachers at a time are going to be doing this? So all of the teachers in our district, all of our elementary teachers will be working on this um, beginning in January over the course of the next two years. Okay. So we'll be, I mean, a full-time teacher's assistant going yes. from, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you. Um, also removing barriers. We continue to move forward with um, band and uh, orchestra instruments, and I'm um, just so proud. These are pictures from um, the practices and then the performances of our middle school and high school all-county band members. They were just so excited to be there. had a, a, the privilege of watching them practice one day. Then I wanted to um, show you, tell you a little bit about, so as we talked about, our um, high school bands and band students are going into the um, elementary schools and talking with them about instruments and, and how um, opportunities are there for them. And as some of our ESSER funds have allowed us, we have purchased kits. And these are called, I never knew these existed until our wonderful um, band and orchestra teachers told them about, told us about these. Um, but these are called wind instrument tryout kits. And I want to pass these around to you because these give our students the opportunity to put these mouthpieces into their mouths of several different instru instruments to try out, essentially, um, these opportunities. So I'll pass these around for you just to know these are our ESSER dollars at work in such a positive way to remove barriers. Sweet. So if a student expresses an interest, do they, do they get a kit handed to them? Or how does that work? Oh. Test this out, should they so choose. Dr. Fry, yes. didn't we a couple of meetings so, ago? Or another, right? Yeah, we do. They are not porous. Through. Yes, sir. I'm glad you asked that. They are, because they're not porous. We're like, huh? <laughs> we have already worked diligently with Scott Massington, and we have a process in place for sanitation. Thank you. <laughs> I want to be the first to try. <laughs> And then, um, as we talked to you about previously, we will have spring arts fairs in our elementary schools. Um, so again, our students can um, learn from their high school um, heroes about different instruments that are available and those opportunities. 
Um, I wanted to also briefly touch upon the instructional rounds that we are doing. Instructional services staff are visiting all schools over the course of the year. And I know this document is difficult to see, but I wanted to, to show you the instrument that we're using to provide feedback as we visit classrooms. We are providing examples of ways that we see all of these high yield strategies being used in the classroom. And I remember doing um, one of the first walkthroughs under Dr. Kathy Revis' leadership. So this lives on in our schools. What I also want to show you is an example of a teacher who um, in her classroom, she is using this visual. This is from Sam Gazzardo, seventh grade ELA teacher at Flat Rock Middle School. And she uses these paper clips with the eagles on them to indicate which high yield strategies she plans to use that day. Isn't that cool? Amber Brown, assistant principal, sent that to me as such a wonderful example of this is real time. This is These are the higher order thinking skills that I plan to work on today so that her students know that as well. Also wanted to let you know that we have worked with teachers on a math vertical alignment professional development and we'll have ongoing support. The next one is scheduled for January 18th. Um, while it's important that we have PLC and team planning, it's also important if I'm a fourth grade math teacher to know what's taught in third grade math and also to know what's taught in fifth grade math. Uh, and we are working with this vertical alignment math um, across the district and then our plans next year are to do a similar focus uh, with writing a vertical alignment activity. We believe this can be super crucial to moving us forward um, as we address learning loss. And then I also wanted to share with you, our superintendent was recently featured at a statewide conference. We were asked to share our summer learning program. And um, what you can't tell from this picture is that that was a double room and it was packed. Um, we had so many people ask questions, stay afterwards and ask questions. And I can't tell you the number of emails that I've received following that presentation for folks asking us about our model. And what I'm especially pleased about is, um, and I think this is what most folks were interested in, is the way that our teachers worked so successfully with our community partners and just that rich support that we enjoy in Henderson County. I think that was what we uh, most enjoyed telling our colleagues across the state. Weren't you part of that presentation too, Dr. Fry? Well, it was mostly Dr. Bryan. Yeah. It was not. Uh, <laughs> yes, she she, that's she uh, does. Dr. Fry and Dr. Marcy Wilson were also uh, part of that presentation and significant parts of the press. That was my one slide that I got to speak on. They made you look good, didn't they? <laughs> 30 slides up. And finally, I just I also wanted to share with you that at the AIM conference, we heard about um, this Operation Polaris, which is our state superintendent's uh, vision and moving forward. These are the four areas that um, she and her staff will be focusing on and that we will learn more about in the near future. The one that I especially wanted to mention to you today was um, they are working on, and this happens to be under the accountability and testing section, they are working on what's called a portrait of a graduate. And I know that um, many times throughout my tenure as director of career and technical education, I would have a business owner say to me, so, so what does a diploma represent? If I hire someone from Henderson County Public Schools, what does that mean that they are able to do? What should they be able to do? And my understanding is this portrait of a graduate that North Carolina is working towards will do just that. So I look forward to seeing where that is going. And that is all. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got Rose child care update. Thank you, sir. Child care update for uh, December. Financial, uh, financial projections for November of 2021. Revenues 88,128. The expenses of 66,474 with an operational profit of 21,653.91. It, it was a shorter month with uh, 
Thanksgiving being in, I think we had a couple other days. So I think we were four or five days short than what we are normally. Any questions? Our child care is involved with the um, the sub the extra supplement, correct? Which uh, extra the, supplement? Uh, well, either of them. Um, I was specifically talking about February, but January, are well, they? All of our employee groups are eligible for the retention bonus that we're paying to employees. So regardless of classification or division or otherwise. That's what I thought. Um, okay. But yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. okay. And all state employees are eligible for the bonus that's being paid by the state, correct? The state paid employees, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Correct. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Uh, Bernie, to about wrap us up, local current expense, other restricted funds. All right, I'll get you out here quick. I'll just stay right here and get going. Yep. Um, so this is as of November 30th, um, before we had a budget. Uh, revenues to year to date are $15.8 million, and our expenditures are just over um, $13 million. This, um, the, the gap is a little bit different this month because we just paid the local supplement, as we talked about when we did the budget. Um, the operations are very close to where they were last year. One, um, the major difference is in our operational support is because we are in school. We are operating in school, so we're having expense <laughs> yep. from our, our maintenance department. They're um, in the schools this year, so that's the, the biggest difference that we have this year from last year. Um, I do mention you know, the salaries are not implemented yet, so uh, that will change us a little bit when we get those retro payments in, but we will get more information on that as it comes. I'll answer right. any questions. All right, general operations. Thank you, Mr. Craven and members of the board. Just a couple of reminders. Uh, winter break begins this Friday for our traditional calendar. And our, our flex calendar school started last Friday. Our traditional calendar this Friday, we operate on an early dismissal schedule. And then, of course, we jump right back into it. We're on a teacher work day as we return in January. Then students return. And this group, of course, will meet back together again that second Monday on January the 10th. Uh, but while we're all here together today, I simply want to say a, a sincere and deep thank you to each of you for your leadership and service to the school system uh, during this continued time. It is hard to believe that a calendar is about to flip over and that we are about to be in uh, January 2022. And with that in mind, I also want to say thank you to the men and women who sit and serve alongside me. We have exceptional leadership in this school system. And as we have often talked about, that doesn't mean perfect, but that does mean perfectly committed. People who are here for the right reason, doing the right work in the best way that we can, and uh, we are grateful to do it. So thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you to you on behalf of the board. This is um, about your year anniversary for being our superintendent, and what a year it's been. <laughs> uh, we've experienced a lot, and, um, but you've done, a, you've done a heck of a job, man. And um, just keep it up, and, and we're super proud. And let's get that strategic vision going, and, and let's get moving and putting our school system, um, you know, get a lot of the stuff behind us, and, and let's keep educating our kids with the letters program and different programs we have going. And um, I really, truly appreciate everything that all of you have done. So Merry Christmas to all of you, and, and I appreciate all of you guys. Um, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Second. Second.